over. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the August 10th Springs Municipal Advisory Council meeting. We're starting at 632. Um, Karina, you want to make the announcement for Spanish interpreting? Thank you, Chair Terry. Buenas tardes. Para los miembros de la comunidad que desean escuchar esta reunión en español, tenemos interpretación en español gracias al intérprete Juan Morales. Para acceder a la interpretación, vaya a la pantalla, a la parte baja a la derecha de su pantalla y seleccione interpretación o interpretation. Seleccione Spanish o español. Cuando um, haga clic, automáticamente estará escuchando la reunión en español. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Chair Terry. Thank you, Karina. Um, Vice Chair Parat, would you like to do roll call, please? Yep. Um, Council Member Lombard. Did I mispronounce your name? Lombard, Lombard, Iris. Oh, you're on mute. Can you all say present so that Lynn Marie knows that you're here? Present and, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> all right, thank you. Okay. Um, Council Member Reyes is not yet here. Council Member Alcaraz? Present. Council Member Winders? Present. Council Member Hardiman? Present. Okay, and then Council Member Parada is me. I'm here, and Chair Aturi is here. Here, thank you. Thank you, um, Hannah. So we are back in the virtual setting um, due to, you know, we are still in a pandemic moving into an endemic, but we wanted to make sure that everyone stays healthy. After each meeting and after we look at health numbers, we will reassess. We are, we are all in agreement. We would like to be in person, but um, we just wanna make sure everyone stays healthy. So we'll be reassessing that after each meeting. Also, I just wanna make sure that I invite all council members to participate in the meeting. You can make motions, second motions. You just wanna make sure that you're all participating and playing an active role. Um, we want to thank KSVY for broadcasting and their tech support and Lynn Marie for um, her amazing minute taking. And um, also Juan is here to uh, interpret for us. And then always Karina and the, and the D1 support from Supervisor Gorin's office. We are going to move the ERAP agenda item to the front of the agenda. Our presenter has some time constraints, so we want to make sure that we're able to give him enough time. So we're going to move it uh, to the front after the uh, after public comment. So we will get started with the approval of the minutes. Um, is are there any changes to the minutes from the July 13th meeting? Hearing I none. none. I would move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Oh, was that Joe? Yeah. Okay. Hannah and Joe, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Minutes approved. Thank you so much. Um, public comment. This is public comment on things that are not on the agenda item. So if you would raise hands, we're going to see how many folks we have, and I'm going to try to give a fair enough amount of time for people to make their comments, but it's important that we have kind of a sense of how many people want to make comments. So far, I see two. Okay, I got three, four. All right, the Mac is busy tonight. Okay, we'll do a two minute public comment. Um, and we, uh, Hannah will give you a, are you putting it on screen, Karina? Or are we gonna, or Hannah's gonna give a signal? It's up to you if Hannah wants to um, do the signal, but um, we can also put it on the screen for the public awareness. Okay, well, let's try with the signal. We'll see if that works from um, Hannah. That way we can still see everybody. Okay, awesome. go ahead, Karina. Okay, hey, in the order that I see them, um, and let me make the public announcement in Spanish. Para los miembros de la comunidad que desean hacer un comentario público en artículos que no están en la agenda de hoy, por favor de utilizar la aplicación de levantar mano en su computadora. Serán eh, promocionados a panelistas para poder hacer su comentario. Se les dará un tiempo de dos minutos por comentario. Les pedimos que por favor den su nombre completo para el récord público. 
And just a reminder to those that are making public um, comment to please state your name for the public record. Your time will begin after you state your name. And I will allow Julissa, Marty, Fred, and Dana in that order. Hi, I'm sorry. I um, I'm logged into Zoom under the wrong name right now, but my name is Sonia Carabel, and I'm with Unite Here Local 2850. Um, I we are the Hotel and Hospitality Workers Union in the North Bay, and from our perspective, Sonoma County's economy has a, has multiple deeply interrelated problems: extreme inequality, with many businesses that cater to ultra wealthy tourists while exploiting their largely immigrant workforce displacement of low-income residents due to skyrocketing rents and housing prices, increased wildfire caused by global warming, and mounting pressure to develop historically protected open space. This system isn't working for anyone. And the Sonoma Developmental Center cannot be more of the same old development that creates profit for the owners at the expense of the community around it. SDC is an opportunity for a different kind of sustainable development, which works to solve these issues that the Sonoma Valley faces. In other words, the SDC project should include much needed community benefits. Community benefits agreements or CBAs have been used on a wide variety of projects over the last few decades, especially projects on public land and with major approvals uh, like the SDC. They can legally bind the developer to commitments that the community has prioritized, which can vary from affordable housing to open space preservation, to providing a grocery store and a food desert, to free childcare, to living wages for workers. Our union, Unite Here, has been involved in negotiating such agreements in Santa Rosa, Oakland, San Francisco, San Diego, Concord, and more. For SDC, county residents, particularly in the Sonoma Valley, could determine what is most important based on the community needs. For example, we could push for high levels of affordable and workforce housing, wildlife corridor protection, supportive housing for disabled people, good living wage jobs, and much more. While our union has been involved in community benefits coalitions that have successfully negotiated CBAs or community benefits agreements with developers elsewhere in the Bay Area, there's one important CBA precedent in the North Bay that my colleague from Unite Here um, is gonna describe, Marty, who I believe is on next, um, and he's gonna explain more also about how we can get a community benefits agreement for the Sonoma Developmental Center. Um, so I will yield my time. Thank you. Next, we have Marty. And Madam Chair, do we have two minutes? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Marty Bennett, United Here Local 2. I live in the city of Sonoma. Uh, we share the concerns of many in the Sonoma Valley who are troubled about the development process so far. We don't know who the developer will be or what they will propose. And the state is set to announce the buyer just weeks before the final specific plan vote in November. As it now stands, that is the last time the Board of Supervisors will consider and vote on this project. After that, what becomes of the project will be solely up to the Department of General Services at the state and the developer they will choose. At the moment, there's a lot of uncertainty and mistrust about SDC. That's why we should call for the specific plan to include a requirement for a development agreement between the future developer and the county that addresses key community benefits like affordable housing, environmental protection, and good jobs. That will mean that we can negotiate with whomever is chosen to develop the site to make sure the project is done the right way and meets community needs. We can make more specific demands once we know more about what the project will entail then the Board of Supervisors will have to vote to approve the deal. We will have to make sure the supervisors listen and pass a project with strong community benefits, but this gives us a chance to make our voices heard. Through a community benefits agreement, we can make SDC a truly sustainable and equitable development. Thank you. Fred, go ahead. Um, I don't have much to say tonight. I just wanted to say it's good to see you all again, and um, I'll, I won't take up my full two minutes. Thanks, Fred. Dana, go ahead. 
Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to let you know that I attended last week a tabletop exercise of an evacuation drill uh, simulated for Sonoma Valley. It was completely um, eye opening. Oh, excuse me. And this was through Sonoma County COAD Community Organizations Active in Disaster. Um, so I was just going to report back that it was an eye opening exercise and it was really interesting to see how they deploy. They are also looking for more Valley nonprofits to participate. Um, there are a few on the list. Uh, we didn't have any participation from any of them uh, last week, but um, I just wanted to inform you that that exists, Sonoma County COAD, and it is a fabulous organization of volunteers and nonprofits that are active in disaster. Thank you, Dana. Okay, seeing no more raised hands. Alrighty, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to move the ERAP uh, agenda item to the top. So Mr. Kiff can um, share with us some information. Hi, Dave. Nice to see you. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all, too. Um, thank you, too, for it's very courteous to move me up. I appreciate that very much. Um, so um, uh, Karina asked me to come and speak with you about the emergency rental assistance program that the county runs with uh, community-based partners. I have a brief presentation I'm going to go through. I'm going to not spend too much time on it and then welcome your questions. And I'm going to be challenged to share my screen and share the right one. So what you can do is warn me if I've shared the wrong screen. You should see a screen up that says that it, emergency rental assistance program update. Um, and I'm gonna try to move it once and make sure it moves. Hold on, didn't move yet. Did you see it move there? We're good with moving. Okay, thank you. So this, I'm gonna start with the, the funds that are allocated. Sonoma County has received about 46 million in funds. This is this amount right here. We just got a brief little, a small little reallocation recently from other agencies. About 33 million of that has gone out to, into uh, direct assistance to uh, residents of Sonoma County. And you're, uh, you can ask questions at the end or as we go through uh, and come back to any, I'll come back to any slide. Here's where we are in terms of applications process. We had about 6,600, um, about 5,000 have been decided, meaning uh, some are awarded, some were rejected, um, about 1,500 are left, so 1,548. So uh, that's still quite a bit that are left to be resolved. Uh, the current status, uh, most recently in July, the average award, rental award is about 7,400. About 81% of the applications are being accepted. In other words, uh, less than 20% are rejected for one reason or another. This is actually higher than in recent months. As I noted, about 1,500 remain to be uh, reviewed. Um, that means about 1,200 cases, if you assume 81%, are yet to be approved, which is about $9.4 million. Now, we don't have $9.4 million. We have about, uh, uh, about 5.3 million, and I'll talk about that in a moment. That means we have a shortfall about $4.1 million. So we've been prioritizing things. I'll show you what we did there. Um, firstly, we have asked for reallocation of funds. These are from other agencies across California and the nation that may not have used them. We initially asked for 4.4 million from round one of the federal allocation. We didn't get a lot, we got 312,000. We've gone ahead and asked for another 5 million from uh, the rental assistance round two from the federal government. And that decision hasn't been made yet as to whether or not we'll get that reallocation. We're certainly hopeful that we might. Uh, this is how we're prioritizing things um, about, firstly, we go through 30% uh, of area of median income applicants first, um, depending on when they're submitted, but that's our pr priority. So about 56% of all awardees were under 30% of AMI or area median income. The next tranche, tranche is, is 30 to 50%, and that's about 27% of folks. And then the 50 to 80% is 17% of folks. And remember to be eligible, you have to have qualify at an income level. You have to have had a COVID related impact that had caused you or your family not to be able to make rent. 
um, ethnicity, uh, about 52% uh, non-Hispanic or, or Latino, not, or non-Latino, 35% uh, Hispanic or Latino, 13% declined to answer. Here's the race, race breakdown. We do this for the Board of Supervisors, um, about 52% white. Uh, that often includes people who identify as, as Latino. Um, and you see the other, the other proportions there. Uh, let me see if I can make this work better. That slide came out funny. Um, this is the award by, of households by regions. I apologize, all the didn't come out as it's coming out of my screen. This is the Sonoma Valley one. It's about 8%. So I will fill in the gaps that are here. 8% of all awarded households are Sonoma and Sonoma Valley. So that's zip codes across the valley in the city in zip codes like Kenwood and Glen Ellen too. The largest one is Santa Rosa. This is about 42%. I can come back to this slide and hopefully it'll repair itself. I know one thing that you folks are interested in is the disposition of the North Bay or, um, organizing uh, a programs list of about, we got about 66 names. Um, so of those 66 names, about 46 turned into cases. Now, when we track these 19 of the, these, uh, were no longer trackable by the submitted phone number or email. So they may have indeed be part of, in addition to the 46, but we don't know. This is just what we can track from our records. And this is a system called Neighborly. But of those 46 cases, um, only about eight have been paid out so far. And I regret, I, I, I regret that. It, it, this is taking too long. And I, I, I'm respectful of, of, of that delay and not overly happy with it. About 30 are under review, 30 of the 46, six were denied, one was withdrawn, one other person didn't qualify but may qualify in the future. But of those 30 that remain under review, um, remember some, some were with M, M, NBOP initially, NBOP uh, didn't decide to pursue this program further, some went to Lelouz. Lelouz took care of all of those. And now they're with uh, Community Action Partnership in Son Sonoma, a countywide program, uh, Child Parent Institute and Petaluma People Services Center. And you can see there's 15, 11 and four with those agencies. And this is a percent of, sorry, this is the raw number of how many total applications are pending with those agencies. We are seeing a staffing problem with these agencies to move these along as quickly as I'd like, I think as we'd like. But uh, so basically we've got 46 and 30 are still under review. Um, I'll stop there and uh, welcome questions and comments. Thank you, Dave. And I'm gonna facilitate for a second. Oh, my day's here. Hey. Hi, I'm back. Got some stuff going on. We're all good. Okay. So um, thank you, Hannah. Um, where are we? We're in public. Oh, just in case you had any questions about ERAP or the NBOP. Council. Yeah. Council questions. Council, thank you. All right. Are there questions from the council? Is that uh, Iris and then Celeste? Thank you. Um, actually, could you go back to the um, distribution by ethnics? And what I understood you to say was that um, the 52% white included Latino or Hispanic. Is that correct? Or did I, did I miss here? <laughs> no, no, I garbled um, how I spoke. The 35% are people who identify as Hispanic or Latino. Okay, and then there was another one also, uh, another, with more uh, colors on it. <laughs> this slide is uh, people when they're they're asked to identify by race. Oh, what okay. Happens with the fifty-two is that the white includes people of of Hispanic descent. I know. Okay. Yeah, that uh, is kind of the other one makes more sense because exactly. you know that doesn't make a lot of sense in right. terms of who's needy. Thank you. Okay. And while, while I'm here, for some reason, this slide popped up correctly. You could see the breakdown by uh, basically by region. So again, Sonoma and Sonoma Valley, Sonoma Valley is 8% of the awards. You see, it generally translates by population in terms of what you would expect. 
Uh, again, still welcome questions. Celeste and then Jesus. Yeah, thank you for, for breaking this down. Um, so I'd like to know specifically what steps are being taken to resolve this situation for these these households that are that are under review. I mean, these are households who are quite frankly at this point being left in crisis um, and cannot afford to be in crisis. Um, having been somebody in the past who's needed rental assistance, um, I can well understand what it feels like um, to be concerned about losing your place to live um, and not being able to get the assistance and sort of being stuck in in a bureaucratic crack. So I'm, I'm really curious as to sp what specific steps are being taken to resolve this for those who are still under review, who've sort of been shuffled around from North Bay organizing to the Luz to Community Action Partnership. And some of those people might even at this point not even know where they are and who's managing them. So th thank you for the question. I, I did um, ask our staff to try to put an end to this, a successful end to this, because I think people have been drawn on too long. Uh, this involves a relationship between our own staff, which is a person and a half, and then um, the community-based organizations, which are doing this in addition to their other roles. They've gently complained that everyone is stretched. Everyone is stretched thin doing this work and the other work that they do, because they do more than just rental assistance. But I do think um, we need to resolve this quickly. Uh, I've asked our staff to work with them, the CBOs, to come up with a plan to do that quickly. Thanks, Dave. Um, Jesus. Yes, thank you, Dave, for presenting. Um, I just wanna, hmm, I wanna ask about if you can disclose the reasons why people wouldn't wouldn't be allowed to qualify or it was it because they didn't have a strong uh, application or are you doing some follow-ups about these or are these people that did not qualify are applying somewhere else um i just want to know about maybe perhaps identify some key points for people to have a strong um applications because uh, obviously <clears throat> a lot of people in in the in the county needs assistance thank you and thank you for the question so um the the things that can go wrong with an application are there's a handful of things one is that um either side the person preparing them or the person submitting may not be communicating aggressively to get the documents in. So sometimes um, the agency will wait until the applicant gets things ready and kind of plod, plods along. And, and people have lives, they're busy, so they can be late in submitting documents. So I think my biggest, our, our biggest concern is when that just sits there and no one pushes it, whether it's the applicant or the CBO, because you, you have to get the documents in. And the documents are things like you know, evidence of your COVID impairment, um, evidence of, so, so job loss or job delay at whatever time that was, uh, so evidence of the rent uh, remaining, evidence of your normal income. So these things all have to be part of the application and they don't, they don't always come in at once and take a while to gather. That's the major thing that slows people down. Generally, uh, especially with the NBOP lists, you, you haven't seen that many people that were denied, right? Um, going back to my slide, I think there's only, there's only six that were denied. So it, it does seem to be an issue more of gathering the right paperwork on time. And again, that's what, as Celeste asked, that's what I think we as an organization need to push harder right now to help, help these just not sit on people's desks. And I don't say that disrespectfully. Thank you, Dave. Are there other comments from council before I go to public comment? Okay. We will go to public comment and we'll see how many folks we have and make a determination on time. So far, I only see one, one raised hand territory. Yep.
Okay. We'll go with, I see two hands. So we'll go three minutes. Okay. Just a reminder, uh, please state your name um, for the public record when you make your comment. And the order I see them, it's Fred and Mario. Fred, thank name, you. Um, hi, Dave. Thank you for your presentation. Um, Hello, Fred. Um, I feel rich in minutes with three minutes. I can just relax and just say what I want to say. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, thank you, Dave, for your help with my own case. Um, I appreciate that. And um, it came, the ERAP was was uh, advertised at the beginning for rent in arrears and for, um, you know, future rents. And so in my situation, um, you know, the, it was, I think it was future rents. And so then it came out that, that the, um, the agencies were prioritizing rent in arrears. And I think that's what they're still saying, but I seem to recall about six months ago, an order came from the state that said that, that future rents would be considered just as well. So, I mean, pe people have a need. Um, and I was just curious if, if, um, if people who have future needs are, are being shunted aside for rent and arrears and where that really stands with the state at this point as far as, as how, how these uh, nonprofits should prioritize the cases. Uh, th thanks, Fred, I'm happy to answer that. So um, Fred's right that there was a period of time where uh, the state was guiding us to prioritize rent and arrears versus future rent. What has happened now, now that we're in August of 2022, the rent for which people can ask for assistance from is between the period of March 2020, right when the pandemic started, and March 31st, 2022. So if anyone has not asked for and is eligible for rent for 18 months between those, those dates, so not 24 months, but 18 months, um, they can still um, uh, try to ask for it. However, as I've pointed out, the shortfall um, is already there and, and we're prioritizing applications that we have in place right now. Thank you. Mario, go ahead. Thank you very much. Mario Castillo, uh, Sonoma Valley resident. Um, thank you so much for the presentation and thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, so I, I was one of the organizers that put together a series of clinics, uh, a couple of clinics in collaboration with um, with the Sonoma Valley Housing Group, MBOP, and Food for All. Out of um, um, uh, I know that there is at least um, twenty of our volunteers from from uh, Food for All who have been waiting, who don't even know what their case is, um, and I have a uh, I've been. I've been trying. I've been going back and forth with a person who has been uh, taking care of a, a of a case that I personally am involved with, uh, with a, a partnership, a community action partnership, and they just basically are giving me the runaround about the specific case. Recently, I even reached out to uh, Supervisor Gorand in wanting to to see if she, if she could if she had any ideas on how to how to go about this particular case. Uh, I also inquire about about uh, the um, the uh, uh, about whether the volunteers actually know anything about their case, and they again, you know, they don't even know where their case is. Uh, and um, so the le the last uh, the last uh, uh, message that I got from um, the caseworker at, at CAP was that that they were uh, they were required to provide the following message. Thank you for you thank you for inquiring. Regarding the Sonoma County Emergency Rental Assistance Program, we are bound by legislation and must pri prioritize applicants that have not received any prior assistance, especially applicants with rental and utility uh, uh, help in 2020, 2021. We can add you to our waiting list for additional fund requests, but our funding may expire before we are able to review our request. So, which means that we're technically, are, we're, we've been, we have been in, in a waiting list and then now they wanna put us in an additional waiting list. And this is just, uh, and, and, and to me, and then I even wrote to, to uh, Supervisor Gorin uh, to say like, well, uh, promises that, that people were given. He said, well, if people were, uh, were uh, made promises, well, I wanna know who, and, and, and it's like, well, it's no, it's, it, it was the promise that, that 
there was help. There was help, and that help never has never uh, come to the people who actually apply for it, who are in need of. Uh, that's that's, and then it's also the credibility of us who uh, who put the work, who put the, our name out there, and have been basically uh, played, uh, and nothing has happened. Uh, so that's that's basically why I requested that this that this become a public record that. Uh, we've been doing everything on our power to try to, to resolve this and to find out what exactly happened. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate your assistance. And if I can get your information, I would like to follow up to see if you can help me with uh, this particular case. Mr. Castillo, thank you for your question. I, I would be happy to help you with all 22 names. If you wanted to uh, give those to me, I'll, um, I can put my email in the chat and or Karina and Maite know how to find me. Uh, we'll follow up with each one of those folks to make sure they're in the system, and then we can kind of advise where they are in the system. I'm happy to do that for you. Thank you, Dave. Are there any final comments from the council? Quick acknowledgement, hey. Chair Aturi, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, the chat is disabled for our community members, Dave, so it is preferred that community members reach out to me and we can assist them in providing the emails. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Karina. Um, Dave, I really wanna thank you and acknowledge, I know that you walked into this midstream and I do really wanna acknowledge and appreciate your courage to show up to a meeting where people are have been upset by this for quite some time. And I have always respected your willingness to show up and, um, and answer the questions. So thank you for that. I really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. Very good intentions here. So I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, we know you have to scoot. So uh, I think we made it in the timeline. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your patience again. I really appreciate it. You guys right. take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, I want to acknowledge that Mari Karman is with us and Supervisor Gorin. Okay, so we have community uh, event announcements. Karina, I'm sure you have one. I'm wondering if anyone else has one. Uh, so far, we have one, uh, two raised hands in the audience. Hopefully, there will be more. Si los miembros de la comunidad desean hacer un anuncio comunitario, por favor de utilizar la aplicación de levantar mano para hacer su anuncio. Okay. So far, two after Council Member Reyes. Okay. Mari Carmen. Hi. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, good evening to everyone. We got feedback. Can you hear me better? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, just a quick um, invitation to Summa Valley Back to School Health Fair this Saturday from 12 to 2.30 at Altamira Middle School. And um, it is for Summa Valley students, whether they go to school here or not, as long as they live here in Summa Valley. And uh, yeah, we're very grateful. We have over 40 agencies participating and very grateful to all the back to school uh, committee and to all the sponsors who have, who have helped us raise um, just over $20,000. Um, special shout out to uh, Supervisor Gordon, who was one of the first donors. Um, so yes, um, and, and uh, students do need to be present. That's one thing for sure. If any questions, please let me know. I can give Karina my work email um, if, you, if the community has any questions. A rapidito en español, les invitamos a la Feria de Salud Regreso a Clases para este sábado, uh, 13 de agosto, de las 12 a las 12 y media. Es para estudiantes que viven uh, aquí en el Valle de Sonoma, ya sea que vayan a la escuela aquí o vayan fuera. Es, el estudiante sí debe estar presente. Les agradecemos a todos los patrocinadores, al comité organizativo. Eh, y pues, le, le, les esperamos. Eh, y un agradecimiento especial a la supervisora Gorin, que fue una de las primeras patrocinas, patrocinadoras. Gracias. Thank you, Karina. I mean, thank you, Mari Carmen. Karina, did you have one? An announcement? I do, but I'd rather let the community go first. So, Karina and then Sam. Thank you. Hello again, uh, Dana Bravo. Um, I would just like to shout a reminder out for uh, the September 10th Community Festival and Emergency Preparedness Fair. 
that will be taking place at Larson Park um, again Saturday, September 10th from 3 to 7 p.m. Uh, looking forward to see folks out there. And now that publication has gone out, there's a lot more interest. So we are continually adding folks. Um, so we hope to see you there. And I also have a second uh, announcement on behalf of the Sonoma Valley Collaborative. We are, uh, we have been enlisted to um, help with a survey about the, the area's climate uh, hazards and awareness and what uh, potentially pg e can do for us as a community. Um, so I do have two, uh, they're essentially Survey Monkey links. Uh, this will also be available this Saturday at the health fair and again also at the uh, community preparedness fair. But um, Karina, maybe I can coordinate with you and get you those, um, those links. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Sam, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Simple Officer for Creative Sonoma, which is a division of the Economic Development Board. Um, we were asked to to share good news with you today about a new uh, grant program that we launched this year. And we've announced the first fellows, first six fellows for a new program called the Arts and Cultural Equity Fellowship and Grant Program. Um, and this was intended for arts and culture workers who work within on behalf of or to support Sonoma County's communities of color. Um, and so we have announced the first six of those folks and in Sonoma, Sonoma Valley, one of those is Jesus Bravo, which I know has done some work with your Mac in the past. And we're really excited for him. Um, the, the project um, goal is to support and advance um, these artists and cultural, cultural workers economically and creatively. creatively. Um, so we are excited that um, Jesus has said he was going to buy a new welder to expand his work in different material options um, and increase his work, um, as many of you know, as his ideas for connection to the land and ancestry, and we're really excited to have him. Another semi-finalist from Sonoma Valley was Victor Farrar from Grupo Folklorico, and he also was our designer for our promotional materials for this program. Um, so we were, we were excited to have him on board too. Um, so those six uh, winners will be spending $5,000 in grant money that comes from uh, Creative Sonoma. Um, we were supported also by the Manitou Fund, which helped us to increase that so that they have professional development funding. Um, and then, so this winter, once the six month period is up, we will be able to have a community event or announcement about the great work that these uh, fellows have done. So we just wanted to keep you abreast and we'll let you know when that community celebration takes place, hopefully January or February. Thank, Thank you, you Sam. so much. Thank you. Um, I think Maite has had to step away for a second. So I'm going to move ahead in our agenda to Supervisor Gorin's update, if Supervisor Gorin is able to give that now. Is that is now a good time? Vice Chair Pirat, sorry to interrupt. I have one quick announcement before oh, the Sorry supervisor. about that, sorry, okay. go for it. Yes, um, queremos invitar a la comunidad a participar en la charla comunitaria que se lleva a cabo mañana jueves 11 de agosto de 6 a 7 de la tarde. Estaremos hablando sobre educación cívica. Tendremos una presentación sobre las diferentes, los diferentes recursos a nivel condado y quiénes son sus representantes a nivel ciudad, condado, estatal y federal. Así que por favor no falten. Mañana los esperamos en charla comunitaria. Uh, quick summary, charla comunitaria is happening tomorrow, August 11th, from 6 to 7 p.m. via Zoom and Facebook o oh, a través de Zoom y Facebook. Uh, we will be talking about civic education, learn who are your representatives at the city, county, state, federal level, and how to access resources available. So please spread the word. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Okay. Um, Supervisor Gorin. 
a great announcement, Karina. And uh, for your humor, I have studied Spanish for three semesters and not a perlaba. <laughs> so she's crafting some language for me and will be tutoring me tomorrow on the correct pronunciation because I'm a dunce when it comes to speaking uh, other languages. And although I did learn sort of French and which is amazing and interfering with my Spanish a little bit. So um, um, thank you, Karina, for that announcement. And my printer, you may have heard in the background, is cranking madly away because the uh, Sonoma Developmental Center specific plan draft has been released today along with the EIR. And although the speaking points were delivered to me and some of the press uh, reporting on this, I encourage you all to go onto the Permit Sonoma website uh, and I'm trying to crank out. The draft plan is 198 pages long. And when I print it out, it's single page, it drives me crazy. But, um, and I have not even ventured for the EIR yet. So um, we are planning uh, with your MAC and the North Sonoma Valley MAC, a joint meeting for the presentation of the specific plan on August 24th. Hopefully you can attend that. Uh, and also I know Karina will be working with Maite and Hannah on scheduling an agenda item for your next MAC meeting so that you can coordinate comments to be delivered at the next joint meeting uh, at the end of September. And so I encourage you to uh, do a quick quick read of the uh, specific plan. I think it's not much different than some of the um, in, um, drafts or alternatives that we've seen before, but a lot of good language and a lot of good visual images in the plan. Leave your mind open as we navigate through this. And I know that people are concerned that specific plan is moving through the process when the state uh, concurrently is moving forward with an RP for a developer. And I appreciate Marty's uh, suggestion on a community benefits agreement. I did meet with Marty and a couple of community members about that. It's worthy to explore. I'm not exactly sure about the timeline and the sequence for that, but I would suggest that we have a specific plan. We probably will have a development team with multiple members of that development team. And I know some of those development teams are forming now with some local members. There will be opportunities for the community to work with the developer and permit Sonoma as it navigates through the development process, probably over the next 10 to 20 years. This is, you know, just breathe deeply. It's going to take a while for this uh, to navigate through the process of not only approval and, uh, and a nod from the state in the negotiations, but as the development proceeds. So we'll, we will have other opportunities. It's not a one-shot deal, but the first part of it is coming up for the MAC and the CAC to comment uh, with the comments delivered to the Planning Commission and that uh, will be coming to the board, the final draft will be coming to the board probably in November. So um, get your speed reading, uh, your reading glasses out and your speed reading uh, up to date because you'll have to sift through that and jot down some notes as you're reading through it. So that is my announcement for today, hot off the presses, but uh, just a brief update about our long meeting yesterday where we tackled two different things. Um, one was the well ordinance that is being proposed to move through the approval process. You think that people in the Springs area do not have wells. Indeed, they do have wells. And so they will be either paying fees and navigating their way through the Valley of the Moon Water District, or try, especially those folks taking out permits for new wells, they'll have to navigate through the well ordinance at some point in the future. And we are taking a pause to do some more community outreach. Uh, potentially, we could have some of the outreach and a short presentation before the MAC, although it 
applies more, I think, to Glen Ellen Kenwood than it does in the Springs area. So that is uh, moving through the process. And it's especially relevant in Sonoma Valley because we are the area, the basin that has declining groundwater. And we already are hearing from folks up and down the valley concerned about potential contamination, increased salinity coming up the valley, a naturally occurring contaminants of well water, insufficient water, wells going dry, and the concern that people are drilling big uh, wells right next to those who have shallower wells. So uh, welcome to California. Finally, California is grappling with groundwater, the last state in the nation to do so. And the afternoon session yesterday was uh, really a workshop on housing strategies. We are updating our housing element. I encourage you to go onto the board agenda. There's a lot of pages in there talking about housing strategies and uh, the public outreach that may happen in the future. So if the MAC is interested in that, we could work with a Permit Sonoma to give you a presentation of some of the housing strategies that we are proposing or at least wanting to track. And this is the first time before we just rezoned land and said, okay, developers have at it. But now we're actually tracking the success of some of those strategies in preserving mobile homes, affordable housing, ADUs for affordable housing. So it's not as easy as it has been before, but the stakes have risen in that we have to um, somehow uh, rezone land for almost 4,000 units in the unincorporated areas. And before it was like 500 to 600 units in the unincorporated. And now it's like, whatever, six, seven times, eight times that amount. So it's not only developmental center, there could be other areas in Sonoma Valley and other areas around the county. So I'll conclude my presentation. Thank you all for being a part of the MAC. And I really need to thank the chair and the vice chair and Karina for all of your work uh, working together. It's, I think it, you as a municipal advisory council are coming together and an official welcome to you who are new members of the MAC. And I'm, I'm excited for all of you. Thank you, Supervisor Gorin. Um, we'll take public comment. Okay, seeing none, is there any comment from the council? Hannah, is your hand up? Yeah, um, so this is kind of a question for Susan. You were talking about tracking um, new housing or, or you were talking about tracking the effect of rezoning. Um, will, will that tracking occur with the rezoning that occurs from the spring specific plan? Because wow, what an interesting uh, initial thing to track for our area. And, and I would think that you were recall maybe a year ago, a year and a half ago, there was a rezoning effort where we identified parcels in the Springs around the city of Sonoma, Glen Ellen, Kenwood for rezoning. And it, we decided to collapse that effort and move it into the update of the housing element. So there will be a rezoning effort associated with the housing element, which is pretty traditional to look at specific parcels uh, and increase the zoning of those specific parcels uh, to make it more attractive and economically viable to actually build some affordable housing. So it's going to be, uh, again, it's gonna be a long process. We're just at the beginning of the community conversation. And it's interesting, you might pay attention to the conversations at the city of Sonoma, also in the process of updating their housing element. And it's one of the areas uh, that has been noted by community members about why it might be important to engage in a conversation with the city council on potentially shared services, including planning services, as well as some other services. We have not finalized what that looks like yet, but we still are um, uh, looking at engaging with the city council and all of the residents in Sonoma Valley about how we might go about that. Thank you. 
Celeste, and then we'll go back to public comment. You're on mute, Celeste. Thank you, Supervisor Gorn. Um, I just, I'm hoping that maybe later we could revisit in more detail the issue um, around the, the ADUs, right? The, the guest houses, and I think that comes into play heavily here in the Springs. Um, we have historically had a lot of those that have supplied housing for single people or for couples, who, especially those who are low income, as historically they used to be a, an affordable option. In fact, that was my first um, house by myself when I first moved out was um, an ADU. And now it's no longer really a viable option for so many in our community. Um, in particular, homeowners are finding it very hard um, to be able to build them. Um, and as we know, in the Springs, a lot of people have bought properties where, you know, in the 60s, 70s, early 80s, people built places and they didn't necessarily have all the permits and have been trying to go through the permitting process and trying to find a, a reasonable pathway to um, getting their buildings permitted and up to code and, and to follow the rules and to be in compliance and are finding that that's impossible to do um, and are actually as a result ending up having to tear down perfectly livable um, ADUs and so we're losing housing. So I'm hoping maybe we could um, have a deeper discussion about that as maybe you have more information and we could have actually a specific ADU conversation. Thanks, Celeste, and thank you for um, really volunteering that that was one of an important housing option for you when you moved to Sonoma Valley. You are not alone. There are a lot of folks living in converted garages, maybe not legally converted garages. And I, I know from my limited experience in trying to help constituents that permit Sonoma yeah, sometimes they're, they're pretty hard edged in their code enforcement coming down hard and sometimes they just want to get to yes. How can we work with the homeowner uh, to legalize and make sure that their converted unit, whether it's a garage or a, uh, a little shed in the back, is safe? Often they're missing um, plumbing. Uh, and so how do people, and that's the discussion that we're having with the concept of tiny homes uh, because it's been a recurring concern that many people are being, some people are being forced out of their tiny homes because they lack sanitation facilities. We want people to be safe. And so we are exploring perhaps composting toilets as an option. So, um, but it's, it's not just the county, it's the regional water quality control board that has a vested interest to make sure that we don't have um, contamination happening and people know what they're doing. I, I think it would be a really good discussion to have with the MAC, specifically around ADUs, because I know I've talked about this with Jane Riley and Tennis. Oh, this is a great thing for the Springs. Well, not so easy to do. And it's expensive to put an ADU and put all the hookups in. So I think it's a really valid comment to make for this body to permit Sonoma to figure out a better way of legalizing non-conforming units and how to make it as easy as possible for people to consider ADUs on their property or JDUs, which is a junior accessory dwelling unit that is the converted garage in the house. So, and shared housing is another option, but if you're interested, what we might do is find some time. I know your agenda is packed full in the fall, but maybe we can hold a community workshop on this. Okay, thank you, um, Supervisor Gorin. We're gonna take Fred's question next. Thank you for letting me come back in. I was in the kitchen making a salad when I missed public comment, but I wanted to ask Supervisor Gorin, um, I attended yesterday's all day meeting and uh, took the day off to do that. And I was able to do that because my rent is half the county median rent. So uh, that allows me to participate in civic stuff because I'm not having to work all the time to pay 2000 plus a month. But I wanted to ask Supervisor Gorin, uh, um, I didn't really have a clear takeaway from yesterday's housing element uh, section of the meeting, and I was wondering if if you could give me, you know, what your takeaways were. Uh, 
I was kind of looking to see that a permit Sonoma is, is going to really hit it out of the park and really tackle the equity issues we have in the county. And I didn't seem like I quite heard that. And so I just wanted to know what your impressions were and, and uh, maybe what, what we can key in on in the county housing element in Sonoma Valley from your perspective. Uh, thanks, Fred, and thanks for your comments throughout the day. It was a really challenging day because guess what? Our hybrid format was not working. It was very frustrating for both the board and the community to be cut off frequently, but you had persistence and patience and kept with it. Um, and I don't have any takeaways other than I volunteered that uh, we need to look at preservation of our mobile home parks or at least have a um, a provision, um, someone suggested that Vermont has a state law that specifies if a park is for sale, that owners, um, the homes in the mobile home parks would have the first right of refusal to uh, co-opt that uh, park and keep it in uh, ownership of the owners there, which was interesting concepts. Always been a really important source of affordable housing in Sonoma Valley. We have many, many parks. And um, Siesta Apartments did purchase the park. They relocated the folks and, and, uh, and offering 100% 92 units of senior housing on that site. And that may be the trajectory, but we wanna make sure that people find a place and not just evicted. Uh, so that was my one contribution, but uh, I think that was just the beginning of the conversation. I love the fact that Jane Riley volunteered that they are tracking um, the efforts and the strategies moving forward because just rezoning land is not sufficient. What we really wanna see is housing units on the ground. So stay tuned. I think it's a conversation, evolving conversation over the next couple of months uh, before we bring that back. Okay, thank you, Supervisor Gorin. And um, I'm not seeing any more questions from the public. Is there anything else from our panelists, from our council? No. Nope. Okay, so I would like to check in with Juan, our interpreter. Are we, do we need to take a break, Juan? Juan says he's good. Okay. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much, Supervisor Gorin. We really appreciate you. your time. Okay. So we're going to go to Chief Aker with his update. Um, Chief Aker, are you here? Give me a second, Vice okay. Chair. We're just thank promoting you. him and it takes a sec. And Got it. Okay. You. Very good. Hello. Hi, welcome to Baker. Good evening, Hannah and Karina and uh, the Springs Mac. So um, thank you again for allowing me um, a brief period of time to uh, share with you some of the current events and happenings within the Sonoma Valley Fire District. Um, there are three things that I really wanna focus on tonight and share with the, with the Mac as well as the public that's in attendance. Um, the first is our vegetation management program. Um, as I think uh, many are aware, we are continuing um, to partner with the county in providing vegetation management inspections. We have a focused area. We have completed uh, 250 inspections um, in areas in the springs from uh, around the Waterman area. Um, what we've found uh, through these efforts is um, it, it, it is a it is a process. It is an educational process first and foremost, and then secondary to that is an, it's a compliance. And so what we've found is we're we're about sixty percent um, in the first year, and this is similar to what we did in the last couple of years where we were in kind of the hillside chestnut area of the springs is the first year is really focused on education. And I think that's what, that from our perspective, that's what the community is able to um, accept and kind of wrap their heads around. And so what we're looking at is um, again, doing a second year in the same area that we're focusing on this year, next year, 
um, to get a better compliance, a better, um, you know, defensible space, better um, understanding of what it means to have defensible space for not only individual properties, but for us collectively as a community. Um, continuing on that, um, we have completed all of the uh, weed abatement complaint inspections, both within the city and the fire district. Um, we are also working with both um, local law enforcement and the Department of Emergency Management to um, address parking issues within the springs. Um, this goes to the larger uh, concern of evacuations, evacuation routes, how do, we, how do we move people in the event of an emergency? And as we all know, um, in the springs and in the maze especially, um, it, they're tight. You know, they were never designed to move um, a lot of traffic or big traffic when, when they were designed. They were designed as vacation homes and cottages. So we're trying to work collaboratively um, as I said, with law enforcement and Department of Emergency Management to do more postings as well as enforcement of parking. Um, parking seems to be the big issue there. And understanding that there's a challenge. Um, you know, there's probably not adequate parking for a number, if not the majority of residences there um, from what they used to be as, you know, a vacation home. Um, but we, we also have to look at the general um, overall safety and uh, ability to evacuate as well as access those areas in the time of an emergency. Um, second thing I, or oh, one last thing on that is our uh, department's chipper program is in service and actively working within the district to help uh, property owners uh, mitigate uh, some of their fuels um, collective, so to speak. Um, and if anybody has any questions about that, please visit our website. Um, we are again in collaboration with the county on their, um, their vegetation management program, chipper program, but um, it, we are up and running and available for use. Um, next thing that I wanted to share was um, and this kind of dovetails in on what was some of the previous um, topics, which is um, the springs and the SDC specific plans and the draft EIRs. Um, your fire district has been very actively engaged in both. Um, we submitted uh, formal comments on the draft EIR for the spring specific plan. And we are we have been working with county planning staff, the consultants, and um, and others on the um, SDC EIR, um, including specifically working on some of the modeling for um, wildfire evacuation um, possibilities or probabilities um, that are going to be a part of that plan. So um, the fire districts. Um, key um, points in looking at these plans is first and foremost, public safety. Um, in general terms, um, in specific terms, it means being able to access areas, being able to evacuate areas, um, but it also means um, on a day-to-day -day basis of being able to provide adequate service. Um, and that's something that both of these developments um, as proposed both the Springs and SDC are going to um, challenge the fire district in terms of um, being able to provide um, our expected and our current level of service to those areas because they're big, big growths. So we're working with planning staff and others to make sure that we have the ability to grow um, our capabilities, our capacity to provide that same level of expected service, which um, we feel is just really critical for um, public safety on not only a day-to-day -day basis, but in an emergent situation or disaster situation. And the last thing I will uh, mention very briefly before opening up to any questions is um, we are definitely in fire season. 
Um, I know anybody that's paying attention to social media and the news, um, we've had some incidents here recently. Um, we had a 50 plus acre fire down at uh, Sears Point that we responded to very heavily. Um, and then we've also responded to both the Oak Fire in Mariposa and the McKinney Fire up in Wairika. Um, we've had a total of three engine companies as well as uh, overhead um, chiefs out there to support those missions. Um, we're starting to get some of those resources back, um, but we are definitely in fire season. And the last thing with that is kudos to all of our people within our organization, because when we do send those resources out, we continue to provide the same level of service here um, within the Valley. And that is, um, that is a tremendous commitment and dedication of our people. So with that, I will end my comments, but uh, be happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. Thank you, Chief Aker. As always, we really appreciate your time and your information. I was really fortunate enough to be able to do a little ride along and one of your uh, colleagues took us through the Springs area and yes. it was quite eye-opening. So thank you um, for um, making that happen for us. And we learned quite a bit. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, I'll take comments from council and then we'll go to public comment. And I see Hannah and then Mari Carmen. Hi, thank you, Chief Aker. Um, this is just kind of like a hypothetical question, but you know, why don't we in the Springs have smaller fire engines? Is that something that you guys have ever thought about? It is, and, okay. and we, were, we were purposeful. Uh, we actually just purchased two new fire engines, um, one for Agua Caliente Station, which serves the Springs, and the second for um, our Glen Ellen station, and they are much smaller than the engines that we had uh, purchased for the city of Sonoma and El Verano. And for the obvious reasons that you mentioned, um, accessibility is huge. And, you know, it's, you know, as much as we try to be standardized in our equipment, um, we, uh, you know, we can't just focus on that. We have to focus on where we're serving. And so a lot of thought and research um, goes into those decisions. And so, yes, we do make those decisions very purposefully, very intentionally. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Mari and then Iris. Uh, um, Chief Baker, I just wanted to um, thank you because um, Chief uh, or Battalion Chief uh, Brian is going to be at the back to school health fair with, a, with an engine and talking about emergency preparedness. So just wanted to, to acknowledge um, you for, for being there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mari Carmen. And I will say that uh, Chief Sear has done an amazing job as our EMS chief. Um, he is so engaged. He is he led our efforts that very collaboratively with the health center as well as the hospital to do the community vaccinations. Um, he's also um, and we'll we'll have him on one of these uh, one of the upcoming Max. Um, He's taken a very strong um, leadership role in AEDs and CPR in the community. Um, as a result of, um, we, we had kind of, we have, as a district, we had been, as a department, we had been exploring ways that we could improve this, but um, the recent CPR save that we had at the high school with the young gentleman um, and the AED that was from the Just One Mike Foundation, um, we're working very, very collaboratively with them in a way that we can, we can take advantage of that success and really translate that to the community in terms of awareness and opportunity to bring more AEDs to the community as well as um, hands-only CPR. So thank you, Mari Carmen. I appreciate that. Thank you. Iris? Um, I almost, I hesitate to ask this question. Uh, has there been any thought to making a few of the streets in the Springs, in, especially in the maze, as you said, one way? Um, and I know it's difficult because a lot of the, those streets, there aren't really appropriate places to park anyway. And certainly it was not planned so that one side could have parking and the other couldn't. 
Yeah, thank you. That that's a really good question, Iris. And I I don't have a great answer for that. Um, what I can say is that what we've done um, or what we're uh, what we're trying to do as a result of that evaluation that included our folks, um, Chair Aturi, uh, Department of Emergency Management folks, we're working very collaboratively with uh, the Department of Emergency Management, Sheriff's Department, uh, Department of Public Works and Transportation. And we're trying to enforce what is currently on the books first, and then we'll see we'll see where that gets us. I think, and then um, that's something that we can do immediately. I think when we look at doing things like um, changing streets to from their two way configuration as they as they have existed and they presently exist to a one way, mm -hmm. it's a bigger lift. You know, it's a bigger process. So what we feel like what we can do right now to make a bigger difference immediately is try to enforce some of the current parking restrictions um, and signages uh, and and really do some enforcement on that and see where that gets us. And then we can take a longer look at things like potentially one-way streets or other um, mitigation efforts to make those, um, those streets both uh, better able to both evacuate people and allow for ingress of um, first responders. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll go to public comment. I see one raised hand so far. All right. Fred, you get a whole three minutes. <laughs> well, I'm really rich in minutes tonight. Um, thank you. Might you might be able uh, to sell them. Go ahead. Thank keep you going. For, the, for the chance to. Uh, to speak and and uh, the Mac is was a really great forum here to get to meet the fire chief, our supervisor, uh, Dave Kiff. This is a really good forum. Um, I have a question for Chief Aker about um, environmental impact reports like the Spring Specific Plan and uh, SDC and the Housing Element Plan as in terms of fire risk. And I'm looking at a 2022 tax credit opportunity area now, and these areas are the, are the highest opportunity areas in Sonoma Valley are up towards Glen Ellen. Um, and also it looks like, you know, kind of west of Arnold there a little bit. And, and some of those areas are in the urban service area and also on Sonoma's east side, um, Lovell Valley Road, Castle Road area, our, our tax credit high opportunity areas. These overlap also with fire risk areas, but from my recollection of the um, urban wildland interface and fire risk um, maps, that these, these are really not the high risk areas. There is some risk in all of Sonoma, Sonoma Valley, we could get flying sparks and houses could burn down. But I just wanted to kind of put in a plug that, that the urban service area with municipal water and municipal sewer is an area that, that in my opinion, should not be become like a gated community on the basis of fire risk and uh, groundwater issues. Um, you know, that it's just not right that, that, that uh, fire risk be used that way when maybe it's not the highest fire risk. So I, I'm kind of rambling on here, but, but I, I wanted to kind of put a plug in that, that, that housing equity needs to be a, a, a um, issue here in these risks. And I hope that you would consider that because um, I know that, that it's, it's become somewhat of a political football here to for a, at all these specific plan meetings, project meetings, people talk about fire danger. They go, we don't want to be like paradise. This place is going to be like paradise. And so um, I just wanted to call your attention to these, that there's a there's an overlap between the highest opportunity areas where affirmatively further how fair housing should go, and also maybe a little bit of higher fire risk. And I think that that's a risk that um, that we need to take in order to be an equitable society. So that's sort of a bunch of comments and opinions rolled into one for you there. And uh, good to see you without the blue uniform on, Chief. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. I appreciate that. And uh, just uh, briefly, 
uh, to address uh, a, a number of points that you brought up in your comments. Um, number one, uh, the fire hazard severity zones. We are paying very, very close attention to that. The maps are being redone right now by CAL FIRE and we expect them um, by, I would say, fall. Um, and, and those are, you know, those are maps that, uh, you know, have some impact for us. Um, they tell us, uh, and this year with those maps, they are using a very uniformed um, designation and set of criteria to set those designations uh, throughout the state, which is the first time they've done that. Uh, it, it has not been, um, they've, they've, as best they can, um, eliminated the uh, political aspect of them. Uh, so that's something we're definitely paying attention to and we'll use in our comments on, on both the Springs and uh, SDC. Um, another element that you brought up, Fred, was um, Lowell Valley and some of the different areas. Um, some of them are, you know, for us as Sonoma Valley Fire District, we don't, we, our service area is not Garricky Road and Lowell Valley, though if there were an emergency, we would obviously be responding there. Um, it's not our um, it's not our governance area, so uh, the, we just need to make sure that we're um, we're on the same page with those. And then, um, lastly, I will say that um, housing equity is certainly very very important to us. Um, it is something that we um, just, in principle, definitely um, believe in and. Um, support but in a very um very specific manner um or application to the fire district is the workforce housing um you know we struggle um to maintain people our our strategic plan and our our practice as a district is to home grow our firefighters from volunteers to career people and it is a struggle once we get career, once people become career people um, to be able to afford housing in the Valley. So that is something that is very, very important to us um, because on a day-to-day -day basis, we rely on our off-duty and volunteers to come in and support us. But um, even more so in the time of a disaster or, or you know, a widespread emergency, we absolutely rely on that um, surge force to come in and be able to do what we've done in the past in 17 and 19 and et cetera. So um, thank you for your comments, Fred. And they are, they're not, um, they, these are not issues that are new to us in the fire district and uh, we continue to work on them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mari Carmen, is your hand back up? Uh, yes, sorry. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, um, I just wanted to mention because I think some of us um, uh, knew uh, Dana, um, but Julie Halter uh, from Halter Project um, is having emergency preparedness event. She had one tonight, and then the next one she's having on the 23rd from 6 to 8 uh, with the Department of Emergency Management. Um, so I just wanted to um, put that out there. Um, and invite the community as well. It will be a bilingual event. Thank you, Mari Carmen. Okay, I think we will close this item. Chief Aker, thank you again so much for being here. Always a pleasure to hear from you. We'll see thank you, you. once. Stay safe. Absolutely, and thank you. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Bye. All right, good night. Good night. Okay, I think we're gonna take a nine minute break. Oh, come on. You're on, Mr. A Steve, Chief Aker, you're on still. There you go. <laughs> Mr. Steve, yeah. Uh, just didn't want him to say anything we didn't want to all hear. Um, so we're going to take a nine minute break. We'll see you all back at eight o'clock. Thank you. Okay. Is Juan ready to go? Okay. Very good. So we're going to go back to item five and uh, do the update. My apologies for um, not following the agenda earlier.
couple of things were going on. So I just want to let people know that Ron withdrew uh, due to personal time commitments. So he will no longer be on the council. And a couple of other things have shifted. So Ron's departure um, opened up another seat. I've been appointed to the SVCAC. So my seat, um, my role is chair and SVCAC liaison, which now means Joe's position shifts from alternate to voting member. So congratulations, Joe. Um, and now we have two alternate positions open. So we are accepting applications. Um, tell everyone how much fun you have here. So we could use uh, some, we could use two new, two more council members. So just actively recruiting there. Um, also, um, we have, I think it's been mentioned a couple of times, but just a reminder, we do have a emergency preparedness event happening on September 10th. Uh, Dr. Nancy Brown from the county is helping us with that. Muddy Cutterman, Dana, Lisa Jansen from the city. So it's really a collaborative effort. Um, and it's taking uh, place at Larson Park. Uh, also, we've been made aware by county council that some of our social media outreach, we need to change our strategy on that. We can't have comments happening from, it becomes a Brown Act violation. So we're going to have to change the way we do some of our outreach. We're still um, having that discussion, but the minutes won't be posted uh, immediately after the meeting the way they have been. We have to wait for the official meetings to be a the minutes to be approved, and then they will be posted. We also um, are working on just how much we can post on social media and what that looks like. So just um, stay tuned on that. Karina, did you want to add to that? Just a clarification. Um, the post meeting notes that were being shared, unfortunately, cannot continue because they're not the official minutes of the meeting. So we do need to wait, as you stated, for the meeting um, minutes to be approved. And the community can find them on the Springs Municipal Advisory Council um, website. Um, and I'm happy to share that with the community if anybody's happy or wanting to reach out to me. It's Karina.Garcia at Sonoma-County.org. I'm happy to provide the links to past meeting minutes. And um, sorry, just got distracted. Uh, that was it. Oh, the other thing with the comments and, and um, Brown Act violation does not allow for any MAC members to post something on social media and to comment or even a like, a like, even a little thumbs up becomes a Brown Act violation. So we want you to be mindful of that. If you as individuals, members of the community post something about your dog or your vacation, that's okay. But anything that is MAC related cannot be um, shared on social media by any members of the MAC or um, commented um, by a like or a written comment. So just that clarification, thank you. Thank you. We can still keep our Facebook page though, right? Okay. Yes, and the other element to that is the Springs Mac currently has a Springs Mac group um, and it is recommended that you decide on changing it to a page because a group requires people to become a member of that group and to give equal opportunity to all members of the community, it is advisable <laughs> to convert it into a page. Okay, thank you for that. I didn't realize that. Um, Lynn Marie. So I'm just wondering about um, whether if I post something to Facebook that's uh, like sometimes I select the agenda and share it on Facebook, it, is that okay? That is perfectly okay. You're a member of the community, so you can absolutely do that. So, um, where there would be a Brown Act violation is if let's say Joe posted the agenda and Jesus commented and said, thank you for sharing Joe, we can't do that. Okay, so, um, so he can't just, share it. 
So I'm staffer. I don't even know who I am, but okay. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> it's council members that have to zip it. Right. Yeah, um, that's too bad. Okay, yeah. thank you. I agree. Um, Hannah? Uh, again, and this is also that the public has equal opportunity. And, you know, the Brown Act states that there can't be any uh, communication between council members without public opportunity for a comment. And it's really like there's, it gets really like, borderline when it comes to social media. So to, you know, prevent any Brown Act violation, that's what County Council advised. Thank you. Thank you. Hannah, did you have a comment? Can we post to say that the meeting is today? Yes, you can absolutely do that. Again, you can post. We just have to make sure that no other council member comments on that post, likes it, hearts it, anything like that. Um, and you can post on the Springs Mac page, which you or, or the group that you currently have, but we want you to convert it to a page. This way, all of the members of the Mac can post on that and you don't have to worry about, you know, Celeste posting and Hannah liking it or Hannah sharing it. It's going to come from one page, one entity representing the Springs Mac. Okay, we might need more clarification on that later. Celeste, did you have a question, uh, comment? Wait, I think you're uh, sorry. I, I actually just wanted to suggest that maybe we could um, get this as an actual agenda item and maybe legal counsel could like give us a tutorial just so that nobody, I don't think anybody would purposely ever violate the Brown Act in this way, but maybe trying in an effort to help in the community, we could inadvertently do something unintentionally. Can we- I think that's a great idea. That for us. <laughs> yeah. Can you bring that up at future? Yeah. And, I, and also because I, I think it would be important for, uh, that it would be um, an agenda item because I also want the public, and I, I know the public is watching now, I want the public to understand that that's what's happening and why it's happening. I think sometimes in the public, they, they look to us um, as, as Mac council members and be like, why aren't you saying anything? And thinking that we're being apathetic when the truth is, is we're just trying to stay in accordance with the Brown Act. So I think if, if we could have that as an agenda item, not only would it help with us as council, but I think it would help the community understand um, why we are not saying anything on social media or liking each other's comments or things like that. Thank you. Okay. Is there a public comment on this item? Fred. Mario. So three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, um, Cherry Tory. I just wanted to say that I, I really enjoyed uh, Hannah's Hannah's uh, notes, and uh, it kind of just makes me feel that no good deed goes unpunished. And uh, so I think that the actual consequence for for something like that or liking someone else's thing, I'm not suggesting that people do it, but it's probably a a, a pitiful, minuscule consequence because even larger. Uh, Brown Act violations just mean like you take it back and do the meeting over or something like that. There's no monetary penalties for so something like this. So, um, you know, the Brown Act is is not like the FBI. You know, it's it's more about, you know, um, sunshine on on the process. And uh, so it's it, in my opinion, it should be that's that's the take home message people should have about it is is not that it's it's kind of like a all these rules that you have to be scared of, but that you that you want uh, daylight to be on your process. And um, so I, I've, I enjoyed Hannah's notes very much, and I'm sorry that 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 they won't be continuing that way. Uh, but um, got to play the hand you're dealt and play by the rules of the game. And um, so that's just my comments. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. Mario. Yeah, thank you, Cherry Curry. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Celeste for her uh, suggestion. Very smart move, and I think that that's one of the uniqueness and uh, uh, you know, just the, just who Celeste is. Uh, always being transparent and keeping things honest, and uh, so I, I really appreciate. Well, I I can appreciate Kalina trying to step in and trying to clarify things. I think that 
I, I just I just love Celeste uh, moving, and I hope I it just gives me hope that we continue to see this kind of leadership that aims to um, be transparent, uh, keeping things honest, and uh, and not you know just aiming to uh, just uh, be nice and hope that people like us, but actually uh, being again. Uh, keeping things uh, real and honest. So thank you, Celeste, and, and thanks, thank, thank you to the group. And I will second uh, Fred's comment as well. You know that it's too bad that uh, we, we we don't get to enjoy uh, uh, Hannah's uh, notes, uh, and just, that was such a nice way to uh, do outreach and to uh, also show transparency and then interest to get to have the community uh, informed. Uh, that's too bad, uh, but thank you for having for all the work that you did, Hannah. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. Any final comments from council? Okay, we'll close that item. Thank you. Okay. We have Sonoma County Health Services Mobile Support Group. And I think Wendy is here to share information with us about what services are offered in the Valley. There was a lot of interest sparked by the um, SAFE team that presented to us a few months ago. And we were told that similar services are available in the Valley. So we're gonna learn about that. Wendy, thank you for being here. Hi, sorry, just getting the tech all set up the way it should be. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen for a brief little PowerPoint. So if it doesn't work, please let me know. We've, we can see it. Thank Great. you. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Wendy Tappan, and I'm the health program manager for the mobile support team um, through Sonoma County Behavioral Health. And I'm just going to do a, a quick kind of overview of our history, what we're currently doing, and what our goals and, and hopes are for the future for the team. Um, and then I can take some questions. So if I can move that slide along. Okay, so we actually started 10 years ago this September. The mobile support team came out of a um, stakeholder process and community planning after the Mental Health Services Act, Prop 63, was passed. Um, through that process, the community really stated what they were looking for was a mental health team that could respond with law enforcement in, in field for mental health crises that were happening within the community. The original team started in September of 2012, and it served Santa Rosa and Windsor. Through two different triage grants with the state, we were able to expand from to include South County and West County. Um, in addition to that, in 2019, we also received funding support from the Board of Supervisors. So unfortunately, right before COVID hit, um, which is kind of, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, kind of hurt our services a little bit, um, like it has for most people these days. So what we are and who we are is we are a team made up of, a, of two people, either a two mental health clinicians, so either a registered intern or a licensed um, social worker or marriage and family therapist and or a AODS counselor, so alcohol and other drugs counselor. And we respond in pairs and we respond to law enforcement requests when there's a 911 emergency for a mental health crisis um, or substance use crisis. What we do is Sorry, it's been a long day, I'm a little tired. Um, what we do is we do everything we can to try to stabilize and provide safety and support in that person's current setting with their family, with their home, with their community. Um, if, if safety is not an option in that sense, what we do sometimes do is we do evaluations for a 5150 hold, which is an involuntary um, hold to kind of mandate people to get treatment. Um, it's sometimes appropriate, but we try to do everything we can to not go to that level. Um, we work in partnership with law enforcement. So we are a law enforcement response team. 
Um, that was the, the design of the program when we first started in 2012. So how we work is if there is a 911 call that comes through um, or a non-emergency call that comes through dispatch, um, law enforcement and dispatch can request that we co-respond with law enforcement. So when law enforcement has gotten to the scene, they feel that it's a safe environment to bring mental health clinicians out, we can come out and um, do what we can to try to support and provide safety at that time for people experiencing a mental health crisis. We do serve quite a few areas um, throughout Sonoma County, and there's the list there on the on the screen. Um, our most recent thing that we've done is we've partnered with the city of Santa Rosa and have kind of changed the way we're responding because um, one of the things we always wanna do is we always wanna listen to the community and hear what the needs are. And um, during COVID and during the civil unrest, a lot, of, a lot of what the community was asking for was a new crisis response model that doesn't include law enforcement where mental health clinicians and other professionals are able to respond without um, having an, an armed or a uniformed officer on scene. So we have partnered with the city of Santa Rosa and their in response team, which is a CAHOOTS style program, similar to the CAHOOTS program and the SAFE program, which it sounds like you guys met with um, a little while back. And we provide the mental health clinician on the van and their team is comprised of a paramedic a mental health clinician, a homeless outreach worker, and then we've got our navigators who um, are working with local CBOs who help connect people to provide a more wraparound service. So we are working two different types of models right now, trying to kind of look and see what is the best way to provide supports to the community. Um, as you guys know, every community has different needs. So what, Santa, what works for Santa Rosa may not work for the Sonoma Valleys. So that's what we're doing now, and that's who we are. Um, our hours are Monday through Friday. We take calls from 12.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Um, our, our hopes are we really want to expand our hours to seven days a week. Um, it's really challenging because crisis happens at all times, and especially on weekends. So we really want to be able to, to staff up and provide that support seven days. And then we also want to expand to North County include, to include Healdsburg and Cloverdale. So that way all of these areas that aren't in a major service area are still getting crisis services. Um, how you get in touch with MST is by calling law enforcement, since we are a law enforcement response team for the Sonoma Valleys, and we do respond to all areas of the Sonoma Valley, so that includes Sonoma, Kenwood, Glen Ellen, and all of those surrounding areas there. Um, I also have my contact information up here also, so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, and then I wanted to, I'm, I'm sure there's some questions, so I wanted to allow a lot of time for that. I can stop sharing my screen. Yeah, thank you so much for your um, for your time and your presentation. I actually do have a question. I'm wondering, um, I have two questions. One, how many teams are there at any given time? Are there, is it one, two, three? And how many responses have you had in the Valley since you've been in operation? So unfortunately, I don't have the numbers pulled right now for how many responses we have in the Valley. If that's something you'd like, I can... Um, get that collected and send it to you guys. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. And I'll, I see there are council members and then we have public comment too. So thank you. Jesus, uh, Supervisor Gorin and Celeste is the order I see. Okay. Thank you, uh, Wendy, for presenting. Um, Sorry, uh, my question is um, regarding how do you assess uh, a call uh, or how do you assess um, if a person having a mental crisis breakdown and uh, it's um, pertaining to best fit for you or is it uh, um, perhaps uh, false negative or 
something like that where actually the law enforcement is needed. Because I just think that it's kind of a, um, difficult to sometimes recognize uh, or differentiate between the two because sometimes, uh, um, you know, when people are in uh, having a mental crisis uh, and then 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 the police comes and then they it's just it can be traumatic for them to have them being arrested and stuff like that and sometimes we have there could be examples of people that are having a mental crisis and they call the police and and i just want to know how they how do you differentiate between these two Thank yeah you. Um, I mean, that's a it's a it's a complex answer, and there's a lot that kind of goes into that, and that's one of the reasons why we're looking at um, what different models are happening throughout the country and within our own community, and why we wanted to partner with um, the city of Santa Rosa for their pilot program to try a program that doesn't require law enforcement response. Um, so for us, for the mobile support team currently in the Sonoma Valley, we do have to go out with law enforcement and the types of calls that we're going on tend to be those those higher level, more acute crisis where somebody is thinking about killing themselves or there's threats of violence towards other people um, or there's a level of psychosis that's so severe that we're concerned that somebody's not able to care for themselves any longer. Um, if we were able to, if, if it was opened up where we weren't going out with law enforcement, there's a lot of other crises that could be handled without law enforcement where there wasn't a level of um, that level of, of, of need or, or violence. Um, that's kind of where we're looking at, at that line. And a lot of the times it's case by case basis. Um, we try to look at the person's history and kind of what their experience is with, with mental health, with treatment, if this is their first time engaging with crisis services, have they been engaged in crisis services quite a few times? Um, to try to figure out what's the best way what way to support people. But currently the way the model is that we're working within is a law enforcement response model. So we are supporting law enforcement when they get those 911 calls and they're needing extra support in how to best help somebody who may be experiencing thoughts of suicide or symptoms of psychosis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Gorin. Uh, Wendy, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, yeah, even though I serve on the board, I learned so much from your presentation. Um, just give you all a little bit of background. Um, we need to thank former Supervisor Shirley Zane for really advocating for this program. As you know, she's had experience in her background as a mental health professional. And she knew that law enforcement needed some help uh, in responding to some of the folks in crisis in the community. Uh, sadly, I knew someone, um, the grandson of a friend who died in an officer involved shooting in Santa Rosa uh, when he was out of control. And it just affirmed uh, in me uh, how effective these programs could be. We had a fatality officer um, involved fatality of a person in mental health crisis at one of our mobile home parks in Sonoma Valley a couple of years ago. And I knew that then that we needed to expand this program. And I, I convinced the board to provide the funding to expand the program to Sonoma Valley. And I believe in the most recent budget conversations, we may have expanded the funding to extend the program northward as well. And Wendy, I'm so glad that you're working with the Santa Rosa program in response because what we are doing is looking at the track record of both the Santa Rosa and the Petaluma program, similar program, uh, to figure out the best of both of those programs to uh, transform our model so that it might be more closely related to Santa Rosa and Petaluma, the CAHOOTS model, which folks have been talking about um, that have been uh, rolled out in uh, Oregon, I believe, Portland, I believe. 
And so we're getting there. And Wendy is part of the success story and delivering this. And thank you so much for all that you do. Uh, you should also know that um, our jails are the largest mental health facility in the county, probably collectively nationwide. And we have in, uh, we're close, not close to completion, maybe a year or two away from completion of a wing at our main adult detention facility for mental health beds. And we will be hiring mental health folks uh, to work with our incarcerated individuals in the jails. And of course, the, why this makes sense is we want to treat them so that when they're released, they're not bouncing back into jails or at one of our other uh, programs that are ill-equipped to handle um, out of control folks. So um, we're doing the best we can with not nearly enough um, funding for mental health services in Sonoma Valley, as you know. We were not given funding for the ARPA funds for the Mental Health Collective here. So we're having conversations with health services to figure out how we can get some funding to implement some of the more complete services in Santa Rosa. So stay tuned uh, in Sonoma Valley, I mean. Thank you, Wendy, once again, but I wanted to give you some background on how this program has evolved through the county and stay tuned. Thank, Thank you, you, Supervisor Gordon. I appreciate you giving a, a, a full picture of kind of the, the history of the program and Thank where you. we're at. Susan, I mean, not Susan, uh, Celeste, my apologies. Hi, thank you. Um, so I have a few questions um, here regarding the the training. Um, is is this team trained to serve those who have developmental disabilities, such as autism, those with intellectual disabilities, and those who have a dual diagnosis? Um, and are they trained to determine, like, is it actually a mental health crisis, or are we talking about a dysregulated developmentally disabled person or a dysregulated intellectually disabled person, um, in particular, those who have speech and communication limitations as part of their disability? Um, also, I have been hearing um, inside of IEP meetings, I'm an education advocate, so I spend a lot of time in IEP meetings throughout the county and actually throughout the state. Um, and I've been hearing that actually that these teams are can be called by the schools um, in, in some instances. And I'm wondering if this is happening, um, especially if this is a law enforcement um, agency involved and these are children that we're talking about. And so there's that. And then what happens when you're called to a home um or or a location and the person who is in crisis is a child do the team members have specialized training in working with children in acute mental health crisis and then if yes they've had all those trainings i'd just sort of like to know who provided that training and if not how can we get that to happen yeah um great great questions great feedback too um and thank you for your work that you're doing with your school in the schools i've worked in the school systems and in crisis settings quite a bit and it's a, a spot that's very close to my heart um and again and more resources we definitely need more resources in the schools um we do respond to schools but we're currently responding with law enforcement to the schools. so if law enforcement's called out to a school and there's a situation where somebody's experiencing these these situations then then we do come along with them. Um, as for trainings, we our, our staff are trained clinicians. So there's a variety of trainings that they go through throughout their graduate programs um, and then through their traineeships. But in regards to, um, I can't speak too much to speech and language disability specifically, but definitely for autism spectrum, we have done some trainings on how to respond and how to help de-escalate um, youth that may be um, dysregulated at that time um, there's a really great, um, she's a parent and also a park ranger, and she does a lot of trainings for first responders. Um, but it's also an area that con we're constantly learning more information about, and we are wanting to consistently get trained and stay up to date. Um, so I'm always looking for and um, excited to hear of more opportunities for training. Um, to help youth that are experiencing that um, learning disabilities and developmental delays and, and other areas that aren't kind of the neurotypical way of looking at things. Um, as for 
um, our staff's experience with working with children. Um, most of our staff have worked with children um, in a therapeutic way, in a crisis setting, in group homes. And um, it's definitely something that we look for because we want to make sure that all areas of the population are getting served. But um, I mean, if we're going to look at suicide rates with youth, um, they are extremely high. So it is an area that we really want to make sure that we're paying special attention to and making sure that um, the youth are getting the support that they need to help prevent a tragedy. I'll go ahead and I'll send you an email um, in particular about the, the autism um, training. Um, I think that that's really important, especially when we're talking about um, autistic people who are also uh, BIPOC people. I, I have a black son who is autistic and my greatest fear is is that and that nobody would understand he's autistic. And that's yeah. a fear that is shared by um, many in, in our community as, as um, parents of, of children um, with disabilities. And so I, I'll go ahead and send you an email and maybe we can connect out, outside of the meeting and I can try to help work on getting some resources uh, to you guys to enhance um, that training. Because I appreciate the work that you're doing. You're doing a lot of really frontline work that's really important. I appreciate the resources and definitely, I mean, it's all about collaborating and working together and learning from each other. So I appreciate that so much. Thank you. I see Iris and then Mari Carmen, and then we'll go to public comment. Thank you. Um, and it sounds like you really have a lot of components in your program that sound really good. What I heard initially, and I want to check this out, is it sounds like at this time, because of the design of the program, most of the calls you get are for people who are in pretty extreme situations. And it's not the people who um, are having uh, due to lack of services and things, basically having a crisis. Um, they're, not, they're not extreme but they're still having a crisis. Is that the case? And thank you. Yeah, um, we do what we can to try to help support. Um, sometimes we will get referrals for people that are looking for help with getting resources um, that aren't quite to that crisis level. And we'll do what we can to help support people um, with some, some light navigation of, um, of resourcing and giving them options of where they can go for, for support. The system is very um, impacted right now. Unfortunately, it's one of the realities of the mental health field is that there is not enough services for the need that's out there. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of the things that would have been kind of um, not quite a crisis yet uh, are turning into a crisis. Um, so we are seeing a lot more people in a crisis setting and responding to them who wouldn't typically necessarily be that quite that high level um, of acuity, but because there's no other options and there's no other resources to get people help and support. So um, if we had a fully functioning system um, and we had all the resources and all the people to, to staff the system the way that we needed to, and if we looked at the system and how to make it work better, um, the crisis team would, wouldn't have to respond and kind of support that population because they would already get um, the support that they needed with providers and community, but that's just not where we're at right now. So unfortunately we are um, doing more of that, but we're happy to help with that also. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ira, or, uh, sorry, Mari Carmen. I can't get anybody's name right tonight. I didn't need name. Don't worry. Sorry. Um, one second. Sorry. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for your presentation. Just quick question. Um, just piggyback writing on what um, Celeste said. Um, in terms of resources, what resources can you provide uh, the Valley um, in terms of collateral material, um, things that are business card sizes um, that can be provided? Because um, they're pretty hard to find even over here or even in terms of promoting of the promotion of, of the program that you're referring to. Um, 
as you mentioned, as basic as suicide prevention, um, what, what can you provide? Um, do you mind re re restating that for me? In terms of uh, resources, um, a collateral material at, at a basic level, what are the like, collateral materials that you can provide for the promotion of um, pro promotion and prevention of, uh, of me mental health situations? Uh, that can be provided in um, in our community, such as like, business card size cards that can be handed out or available at different resource centers or health centers here or agencies. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, we one of the the brochures that we we hand out a lot is effective communication with nine one one, and we have those in English and Spanish. Um, we think that that's really important, especially since we are a, a partnership with law enforcement is how to help support families and in if they're in need of having to call 911, how to how how to have that conversation to hopefully have the best outcome. Um, we also have suicide the hotline numbers for the suicide prevention line, which is actually changing. So it's going to be 988. Um, so instead of having the call, the 1-800 crisis line, you can just call 988 and that will um, get you to a trained um, crisis professional and they'll be able to help um, support people in those moments. Um, as for our program, I think we have a just a general brochure, um, but most of our kind of, we don't necessarily do a, a lot of um, promotion just because we don't have the time to, um, or the resources or availability to do so. Um, I think at one point back in the day we were able to, but uh, unfortunately we don't have the, the capacity to do a lot of that right now, but we do have those. The, I think the thing that would be the most help is the um, effective communication with 911. You, you said the hotline one, you, you have that or you used to have them? We do, but the net, they're changing the number. I think it, the number has gone live to 988 currently. So that's the new, because the, the 1-800 number, the, the fantastic services, but that is such a challenging long number to remember. Um, mm -hmm. I know for most people in crisis, the last thing you're gonna do is remember mm -hmm. a long series of digits. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited that they've done this nationally to change it to 988. So it's essentially calling 911, but for a mental health crisis. And I think that they're working on creating some materials for that. Um, but since it just started, I think in the last few weeks, mm -hmm. um, the materials quite haven't caught, caught up to the rollout of, of the number. And just uh, one um, quick, um, I did try to look up the 918 number for Spanish speakers, and um, it's not the case for Spanish speakers. They still have to call a triple eight number. So I, I, that's one question that I do have is how do you, if everybody, every word's being promoted um, for a 988 for any language, yet you go to the 988 website, all the way you have to go down and then say Spanish, and then you go there and it says you still have to call the one triple eight number. So that's just a little confusing, um, but I know it's not uh, like local agencies uh, fault, but if there's any way that you all can advocate that that be like, cleared up or you know clarified because it's really confusing yeah that's thank you again so much for your time yeah that's extremely helpful information for for us to know and I'll pass that along um to the people I work with and the agencies that are running that because um that's really important to make sure that everybody has access to easy easy ways of communicating so thank you thank you I'm going to move to public comment. See one person. Thank you. Uh, Mario. Good evening. Yeah, good evening, Mario Castillo. Um, I just want to say that I have the pleasure of working with Wendy. Uh, I'm one of the employers, employees, uh, uh, community navigator for uh, in response uh, through Humanidad. Uh, given that, as Wendy stated, uh, it's a collaboration of organizations uh, employed by Humanidad and I'm stationed working with uh, in response uh, at the site. And I get to see Wendy in action all the time and uh, how caring and, and you know just amazing how the work that she's doing to create and make this uh, program work along with uh, all the partners. Um, and I just wanna say, you know, that uh, it's just, it gives me so much hope. I get to be uh, the community navigator, which 
uh, deals with uh, cases that are um, that are refer after the band gets off uh, phone call, and I get to go and uh, visit the families, check in with the families, uh, evaluate the situation, uh, find out what sort of resources uh, they're uh, they're in need of, um, what triggers, what situations are leading them to feel uh, uh, running out of options. Um, it just, I mean, I it just makes me wanna wanna move to to Santa Rosa in terms of this of this program because it just has so much uh, so much potential and so much. Um, I you know I'm a huge advocate for my mental health services, and uh, this really like I have seen you know uh, parents who are uh, who their only option you know are dealing with kids who have had experienced so much trauma. Uh, because of uh, uh, COVID and isolation, and then now all that is sort of creeping in, and they're just experiencing all these uh, mental health challenges, uh, and you know schools are failing them. Uh, the, the system is basically broken, and they're they're in an emergency emergency crisis, and they call nine one one. They that's the number they that they they know to call. And luckily, the, the calls are, are screened, and then the van responds. Uh, a, an amazing group of human beings show up, uh, and then the cases are, are transferred to us, and we start working with the families. Um, so that's, you know, I just, um, I just wish there was more that we can do um, on, this, on this end. You know, when we experience a similar situation with our own family, here in the valley, you know, we we didn't we we never dared to call the police, even though there were situations where we had to, because of, of fear of law enforcement. Uh, had we had you know this option, it would have been a lot easier for us. Um, so it just uh, hopefully you know the in response model uh, really shines shines light uh, to to what's possible. Uh, and so thank you, Wendy. And, uh, Thanks for thanks to the team for bringing her and having her present on this such an important matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mario, for your kind words. He it's just an absolute pleasure to work with and the glue that holds so many of our families together. So um, Sonoma Valley is very lucky to have him as a resident. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the council? Okay. Wendy, thank you very much. Um, I look forward to can I look forward to hearing the numbers on the response to in Sonoma Valley. Absolutely. That, yeah, that'd be great. And if you could break it down by demographic, I know I'm asking a lot, but that would be awesome. I can. That will take a little bit more time, um, but I can definitely get those to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And um, I'm in Petaluma City Schools, and we use the Safe Team quite a bit, so um, we do like that model. So advocating for that to spread a little you know, to a few other places. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. All right. Um, we have, okay, ERAP was, I don't think we need to take public comment on ERAP right because we don't have anyone new necessarily that wasn't here for the ERAP right because we had talked You're about more that than welcome to ask but I don't believe we have any new um, community okay. members and we had discussed in case people came at this time for the ERAP agenda item and had missed it that we would take public comment on it but I think everybody was here that's currently was okay all right we're going to move on to Larson Park letter we have a letter that was um, written by Hannah and Iris. And um, I think we're gonna read through that. And then we're gonna vote on, we'll take minor edits and then vote on it. Thank you to Hannah and Iris, our letter writing team. Um, Mike, I have to say that it was really Hannah's. I wasn't here when it was written because okay. I was away last week. So I just, you know, I want to clarify that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Iris. I appreciate that. Um, Karina, can you make it bigger? Like a lot. <laughs> It's not. Okay, you're getting closer. <laughs> Hannah, do you want to read the letter? I could do that. Yep. Okay. It's it's fine how it is. There we go. Um, but other people might not be able to see it. Oh, oh true. Me. True. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Perfect, thank um, you. RE Larson Park Funding. Dear Supervisor Gorin, while researching Larson Park's history to write this letter in support of infrastructure improvements, we received a lot of help from county employees. Mundo Mergia described the master plan, Melanie Parker explained the history of the park, and Kathleen Colhaney has researched funding attempts. It is clear a lot of work has already been done, and it was also indicated repeatedly that you were a champion for Larson Park. However, the point remains that Larson Park has not received the money necessary to bring it up to date. While we know you're already a champion for us, we hope this letter can help you convince the Board of Supervisors and any other key players to come aboard and find the funding needed to enact the Larson Park Master Plan. Larson Park is situated in the heart of the springs along Sonoma Creek and next to Flowery Elementary School. Nestled in a neighborhood, it sometimes seems like it has been forgotten. The tennis courts are cracked, even though they are used daily by the pickleball players, and the soccer field is not quite regulation size. While there was once a real bathroom, now there is only a dirty porta potty. Little league baseball games used to be played there, where a snack bar provided refreshments for the crowd. Gone are the little league games and the snack bar. Despite all this, the park is still heavily used, but it sends a message that the people who use this park do not matter enough to have nice infrastructure. Larson Park is one of two public parks in the unincorporated part of the valley known as the Springs, the other being Ernie Smith Park. The census tract Larson Park is in has a Human Development Index, HDI, of 4.44 out of 10, as determined by the Portrait of Sonoma report. The HDI is an analysis of various factors like income, health, and education used to compare quality of life. It is the lowest HDI in the valley. The people with the most need are receiving the fewest benefits when the only park walkable from their house is in a state of disrepair. We understand funding is complicated, but we implore you to prioritize finding the funding for this park. From the information shared with us, in 2019, the county applied for a state grant for funding, but did not make the cut. Maxwell Park, located 1.7 miles away in the city of Sonoma, has received funding for improvements recently, even though it is arguably in better condition than Larson and located in a higher income area. We would ask that whatever creative measures funded Maxwell be reproduced to find funding for Larson. Our community, our community needs access to quality outdoor recreation close to home. A local scientist, Dan Levitas, pointed out that Larson is perhaps the only public space in the springs to get into natural water by accessing Sonoma Creek. The views of the Eastern Hills are majestic and the park is a place for all people to experience nature and sports from toddlers on the playground to teens on the soccer field to retirees on the tennis courts playing pickleball. In the interim, we would request additional attention to the porta potty to keep it clean. It is heavily used and needs more attention than it is currently receiving. Thank you for considering, or thank you for consideration of our requests, both large and small, authored by council members Hannah Pratt and Iris Lombard. Sincerely, my territory chairperson Springs Mac, and uh, we've cc'd Sonoma County Board of Supervisors, Cheryl Bratton, County Administrator, Bert Whitaker, Sonoma County Regional Parks Director, Melanie Parker, Sonoma County Regional Parks Deputy Director. Mundo Mergia, Sonoma County Planning Technician, Kathleen Colhaney, Sonoma County Regional Parks Executive Assistant, Parks and Rec Advisory Committee, Assembly Member Cecilia Aguiar Curry, and Senator Mike McGuire. And um, can I just say, Hannah, excellent letter. You are going to be hired uh, to write um, most of my letters. Uh, great information. And yes, um, I've been working with regional parks on Larson Park. Mm -hmm. I, started, I started working with them on Maxwell Park first, almost two years before Larson Park, which is why they got the first tranche of money. And also, uh, thank you goes to assembly member Mark Levine for the earmark of $1 million towards Maxwell Park. 
Um, we, we are due to have a new assembly um, member and I am currently um, having conversations with Damon Connolly who may be successful uh, to provide a similar kind of earmarks for Larson Park. So we're going to be uh, working on the same strategy of aggregating funds from multiple different sources uh, to do the much less expensive renovations at Larson Park than there are at Maxwell Park. Bathrooms absolutely are disgusting and unusable. I did meet with a group of tennis players um, about the condition of the tennis courts. And in fact, the Tennis Association wrote a letter to the regional park saying, we are not encouraging any of our members to use those courts. They're in such bad shape. And I agree, they're in horrible shape. And I wish we could do just maybe this element or this element, but because of the moving nature of the renovations, uh, you have to do sort of all at once. So uh, um, we have talked at length with the board. I absolutely will uh, forward your letter to the full board. And I, as you know, in my district newsletter, I said in my budget deliberations, I've thrown down a challenge to the CAO. We need to come up with a mechanism to fund some of the capital improvements in our parks, especially, but not just parks, multi-use paths, because I'm looking for funding on any of our bike paths up and down the valley. They're not funded. And just talking with Jared Huffman today about that. And so uh, they're supposed to come back to the board next year. Um, Cheryl said that she did have some ideas on how we might move forward and, oh, she's not gonna be here next year, but we will uh, be having a new CAO that we're embarking on a recruitment process. And so that new CAO will have his or her work cut out for uh, to, to really think how we're going to finance our capital improvements on our park. So, um, thank you. I think your letter speaks volumes and we'll send it to the full board. They're tired of listening to me, so maybe they can listen to you. <laughs> thank you, Supervisor Gorin. <laughs> also, also, I would say that because of redistricting, um, we are going to be having a new assembly member uh, whose district will be on the whatever direction that is in Sonoma Valley. They made the district lines right up the valley. So the parks and STC will be in the district for the newly elected assembly member, either Damon Conley or Sarah, I can't pronounce her last name, um, but also technically uh, this area is in the district for Bill Dodd and not Mike McGuire. But I would encourage and, and you to send it to both uh, Bill Dodd and Mike McGuire because they need to join forces, uh, maybe to get an earmark for Larson Park. Thank you. Karina, can you add um, Senator Dodd to the list? And can we can we add uh, Mark Levine's office to the list as well, even though he, I'm not sure, is he still in office there or well, he's still in office till the end of the year and he will have staff and I think it's appropriate. To, in fact, you might add in the letter, thank you, Assembly Member Levine for the earmark for Maxwell Park. We would like an earmark for Larson Park. Did you get that, Karina, to add that? Okay. Um, are there any comments or changes to the letter? I see Celeste, Iris and Joe. Celeste. Yeah, Hannah, thank you for um, this. This letter is beautiful. Um, I think it really sums up how a, a lot of us are feeling. Um, the only thing I would love to just see inserted, um, it's very small, uh, when you talk about um, the park is still heavily used. I think it would be important to also specify that it's also still heavily used for as a community gathering place and for Springs community events, despite 
um, how dilapidated and neglected and ignored it's it's been. We still continue to gather there, and we continue to gather there because we love it. Um, and it's really know. close to where you live, Celeste, right around the it's corner. Practically in my backyard. Um, and then I have some other comments, but should I do them now or should I wait until we're done with the letter piece? Because I, I just want to respond. I have a couple questions to uh, for Supervisor Corn. Let's do the, Karina. Sorry, uh, if I may, uh, Chair Atari, can you repeat your um, sentence and let me know if you want me to sort of take notes and then compile a sentence or if you have specific wording or language that you want me to use and where you want me to insert. Yeah, that. it was just that sentence, despite all this, the park is still heavily used, but it sends a message to the people who use this park, who use this park do not matter enough to have a nice infrastructure. I love that sentence. I just would love to see a little clarification that it's heavily used and, and that it's also used as a community, still used as a community gathering space. Right. Despite, despite the lack of infrastructure there. Okay. Great, thank you. Celeste, I think we'll do the letter and then we'll go back to your other Sounds comment. Thank, thank you. you. Iris? Um, actually, um, Celeste said it's still heavily used, which I think is it's good to put heavily in there. Um, the other thing is, as much as I like the letter, you should, you should I shouldn't get credit for it down there. Um, <laughs> the other, but the thing I would really like to see <sighs> is a request for a hand washing station as well as an improved porta potty. Mm -hmm. um, it, we're trying to teach our children <laughs> and everyone else uh, good hygiene. A hand washing station is um, a, a good thing. Thanks, Iris. Thank you. Great. It should say in addition, it says an addition. In addition, sorry, it should be. In yeah. addition, comma. Thank you. And then I'm sorry, can I, Celeste, can I slightly adjust what you said or, or it's actually how, sure. how it was put on? Um, can you go back up to that, Maite, or um, Karina? Um, so can we just go, despite all this, the park is still heavily used as a, as a meet, as a community gathering place. Can we just put that right there? And then doesn't, you know, then that's got the message and then the sentence, it's just a little shorter, but it still has the same message. Is that okay, Celeste? I think that's perfect, yeah. Thank you, okay. Is this what you suggested? I love this the best. That's fine with me, as long as it's fine with Celeste. I think it's perfect. Yeah, thank you. Iris, did you have any other comments? You're muted. You're muted. Iris. Muted. Sorry, I lost, I lost the screen. Um, no, I didn't, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Joe? Uh, yeah, just random, random knowledge I, I happen to have because I work in Maxwell Park uh, Mundo no longer works for parks. Um, I just I talked to him like a like three weeks ago. Yeah, he no longer works for parks. Oh, okay. Yeah, they just started doing things here, and and we reached out because we didn't get any notification on that Boys and Girls Club side. Uh, he's no longer there. Steve Arrett is the planning man manager for parks. Um, seems like maybe the best person to put in, rather than Mundo. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thank Joe. You. Thank you. Yep. Karina, can you get that name for us? Yep. Whatever name that is, we need to replace that with. Okay. All right. Are there any other comments about the letter? Okay. Any public comment on the letter? Fred. Oh, give me a second. I got to switch screen. Sorry. <laughs> um, Fred, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, I heard in the letter that Hannah said that 
Um, this area has the lowest HDI score in the valley. Um, I've been doing a lot of research on census tract 1503.05, which goes from Verano Avenue to Madrone Road in between Highway 12 and Arnold. And the census tract not only has the lowest HDI score in the valley, but among the lowest in the county. And um, I've been collecting data on, on this tract for years. And so I think that that uh, you might be able to use some of this data to good effect to show the type of need that you have in this census district or the census tract. Uh, for one source I can recommend is the uh, AFFH viewer, the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing viewer. And it has layers and it has little dots and, and uh, data. And, and I just, I have got quite a collection. So I don't know, Hannah, if, um, if I could send you any, or or if you could uh, maybe beef up the letter by, by um, I don't know, just in indicating that uh, that uh, th this is an area that, if it's not a disadvantaged community, it should be, or it's right on the line of not being a disadvantaged community status. Thank you, Fred. Um, if we change the letter, we have to bring it back to the next meeting. So if we want to add the data, we have to bring the letter back to the next meeting with the data included. So I'm wondering- Would we be comfortable saying something like, this is, you know, we believe that census data shows us to be one of the most disadvantaged census tracts in the county? I mean, does that is that a statement that we're comfortable with? And from Fred, Fred's research, we feel like that's something that we can say. I I do. I'm comfortable with it. Okay. Um, I think we should insert something like that so that we can approve this tonight. Um, could we look at the letter, Karina? Yes, I'll need you to repeat it. Too. Okay. Could we check with Fred to make sure that that is accurate with what he said, given what he said? Fred, is that accurate? Definitely. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so repeat your statement, and is this the sentence I'm replacing? No, you're not replacing it. Okay, after it, it is the lowest HDI in the valley, then say, new sentence, census data shows this is one of the most disadvantaged census tracts, or one of the most disadvantaged tracts in Sonoma County. And I think it. Sorry, I'm gonna laugh. <laughs> um, and tracks should be CTS. Oh, sorry. What? Thank you. Um, tracks in this case is T R A C T S. Sorry. No, that's perfect. Census data shows, and then data for after census should be um, not capitalized. There we go. Shows this is one of the most disadvantaged tracks in Sonoma County. Okay, I'm happy with that if everyone feels like that's a good sentence and Fred feels like the data backs that up. Okay, yeah. great. Any objections? Karina, thank you. It's really, really hard to edit live. So thank you for doing this. It is. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Um, I'm, no I'm noticing that it doesn't seem like the uh, additional names um, were included. They in are. Oh, good. I, I, okay. I didn't see it. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay. All right. So with, if there are no additional comments, is there a motion to approve the letter? I move to approve motion. the letter. Okay. Iris first, Joe second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right. It passes. Thank you. Thank you all for your work on that. It's a good, great letter. Let's hope it gets some traction. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on to ad hoc report. Oh, Celeste, you had other questions. Sorry. Thank you for. I think you're it's on okay. Me. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to sort of go back to what. Um, 
Supervisor Warren's comment. So I, I, I just feel compelled um, as, as somebody who way back when was on the Stiff Kick Committee, which was prior to our, our MAC days and our Springs Community Alliance days. Um, we're talking, you know, almost two decades ago. Um, I, that to, to kind of share some of the community's frustrations here. The community has been having really frustrating converse, um, conversations, requests, and basically the begging of the county um, for Larson Park to receive funding and improvements since those days. And so I, I'm hearing, you know, from a lot of people um, who've who've come to me and, and had conversations about this that um, people are actually quite offended that Maxwell Park is getting the level of funding that it's receiving while Larson goes untouched. And when we look at the current condition Maxwell's in and we compare it to the current condition that Larson is in, um, it's insulting. It's it's insulting to our community. And I think that um, I, I know that because people have approached me um, that they feel that we not only are being ignored, but that we're blatantly being told we don't matter. Um, the letter so eloquently outlines that our residents and communities are being made to feel that, that we don't matter. Um, my son, since the age of um, six, has been going to Larson in the creek and cleaning trash out of it on his own. He's 19 and still does it. Um, my children grew up in that park. They continue to grow up in that park. My favorite photos and videos of my children are playing in that park. I walked my dog almost every day in that park until, in fact, I walked her the day she passed in that park. It was her last walk because it was her favorite place. And so I'm wondering what specific actions can community members in the Springs take to get the county to take us seriously in this request? Because we've been asking nicely in this community for 20 years and, um, the result has been that Maxwell Park is getting millions of dollars and, and we're still sitting here. Trust, and, and I don't think people are feeling that they want to ask nicely anymore. So I'm wondering what steps can the community take to, to be taken seriously and to get some traction moving on this um, so that we're not keep, you know, continuing to be told maybe next year, maybe next year, maybe some this person will do it or that person will do it. What things can we actually do? Celeste, I, I appreciate um, your heartfelt plea because this is your neighborhood park. Maxwell Park is a neighborhood park. It's not necessarily um, a regional park. The number of folks that use Maxwell Park probably is significantly higher than the number of folks that use Larson Park, whether it's because the, the facilities are in better condition or not. Um, but nevertheless, I I view Maxwell Park every bit as much a part of the Springs as Larson Park. It's just that Larson Park is a little more hidden um, back there behind Flower School and entering through Deschene. You may have been advocating for Larson Park for 20 years. Um, I hope you were part of the community that came out to the um, neighborhood meetings when we held the meetings. Uh, that really developed the plans for Larson Park because I was there, I was attending every one of them. And uh, it was also at the time uh, that I remember that meeting vividly when uh, members of the community stood up and said, wait a minute, why aren't we going to be able to have funding for uh, implementation of the master plan when it's developed? And I said, well, the problem that we have is there was a shift of park planning resources towards the building of Andes Park. And we all know the tragedy that occurred in Southwest Santa Rosa with the, with the death of Andy Lopez. And so it was parks and that supervisor and the community poured many, many hours into planning Andes Park and found a significant level of resources uh, to fund that beautiful park that exists today. It meant that the park planning efforts of both Maxwell and Larson were put on the back burner because those resources were diverted. It does not mean, however, that regional parks has shirked on resources devoted to Sonoma Valley. In fact, 
uh, we've received more than just about any other district, except for District 5, from Measure M. And that's the measure that many of the folks uh, voted for and supported. And, and the city shares in that as well. It doesn't give you solace to hear that because we still have Larson Park that uh, is in desperate need of renovation. And I get that and I pledge to you that that is the next major effort. Um, but the, uh, the master plan was approved almost a year and a half later than, than Maxwell Park. And so the planning and the resources were shifting to Maxwell Park while we were uh, finalizing the plan for Larson Park, we just adopted it as a board, I believe a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. So it is on the drawing board. We, we are making a commitment. We do know that it desperately needs uh, resources. And so the, I'm, I, this is my bucket list. I have two and a half years left of my term. And I said pretty clearly, it is Maxwell Park, it is Larson Park, and a few other things that I'm really focusing on. So uh, we, we have a strategy, part of the strategy you just, you just helped with, which is bringing this park to the attention of folks who are able to create some earmarks at the state level. And I've also mentioned this at the federal level, but we, we want an earmark for this park for exactly the reasons that Hannah just articulated in the letter. And uh, we, th we think, and, and it's really frustrating for parks when they apply for grant after grant after grant, and they look at the census tracts and they say, well, your income is too high to qualify. Uh, we have much needier areas in the Central Valley or, or the inner cities. And so I said, wait a minute. <sighs> So it's, um, I, I under, thank you for sharing. I get what you're talking about. And so it's a full court, all of us going together to go out and get some resources uh, to, uh, to do th that renovation that is desperately needed at Maxwell, uh, at Larson. Is there anything that we can specifically do other than write the letter that we just wrote to help Susan with the? I, I think you articulated um, much more clearly and from a uh, personal perspective why this park is so important to this community. Um, we've had, when I met with all the pickleballers and the tennis players, I said, send the board letters. And so they did. We had a lot of folks sending board, the board letters and their letters were not nearly as meaningful as the letter that you just crafted. And especially with the addition of Celeste um, um, talking about the love of the park for the from the community because people say, oh, affluent folks wanting to play tennis and pickleball. That's not nearly as mean, meaningful as the surrounding community using this as their neighborhood park and in its, even in its dilapidated condition. So I think you did what you need to do. And the next uh, part of it is to, um, uh, I will let you know if we have a decision point, but I can't give you any expectations that we're going to be able to come up. We're ready to bid the renovations in this park. We need to find the funding uh, to actually respond to the bid. So I'll go back to Steve Errett. He, Steve Errett and Bert Whitaker are the two folks that I've been working with on the parks and um, they will get a copy of your letter and I'll say, okay, let's figure out what we can do. But I also have said to Lelouch uh, Center, yeah, there's some folks um, who are active in the Lelouch Center that may be key to uh, a community fundraising drive as well. We, we have some folks with resources in the community. So I, I don't take no for an answer lightly. I just sort of do little end run. So that's my next effort is to do the end run. Thank you. Iris, and then we'll go to public comment. Um, I am wondering if there were two letters or there was a letter and an editorial recently in the index tribune and i'm wondering if those should be attached i 
think that's a great idea, Iris, um, especially the editorial, because there are very few people in Santa Rosa that actually read the IT. Well, there was a very good letter uh, from Nick Barbalesco also. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, I, I would like to say in due respect that um, comparing Maxwell and Larson is like comparing, a, I thought of this, a watermelon and a cantaloupe. <laughs> um, Maxwell is much larger. It also has the benefit of having the Boys and Girls Club there, which gives it a lot of exposure and public support in the public mind. Larson doesn't have any of that, but what Larson does have, and I would not want this to go away, is free parking. You know, um, I actually think that the parking fee at Maxwell is a detriment to um, it being a community park for the Springs, actually. Um, what, one of the improvements in Maxwell is to provide more parking. And so I understand I had lunch with the Boys and Girls Club today and they said, oh, the machines are over there. They're tearing it up. They're digging it up. They're putting fences around it. So you should expect to see. Uh, some uh, some major construction happening at the park, and also a lot of the dirt uh, that's being excavated will be placed upon the location where the pump track. Um, I expect a lot of kids with shovels are going to be creating jumps and all kinds of things in anticipation of the fundraising drive to do something in honor of Nikita. It was Nicole that came to me first saying, we need a pump track for kids like Nikita. And so I, we recognize the success that this amazing young woman has had. And we need to keep in mind many, many young folks, including those like Celeste's son and others that have developmental dif difficulties who may, uh, you know, I should say my grandson, my seven-year-old grandson is diagnosed with autism, having real challenges um, right now, loves bicycle riding. So it's kids like Tatum and other kids in the community that will find their outlet um, through pump tracks and skateboard parks and lots of different facilities. It, it's not just adding parking to Maxwell, it's the parking fee. Uh, and I and I get it. I seven dollars is an ice cream cone, you know, a nice yeah, ice cream. <laughs> yeah, I, I I I I get that. I understand. Thank you. Um, Mari Carmen, Karina, and then we're going to public comment. Um, just really quick, and I don't even know if this is appropriate, but if there's any way that we can invite like the community engagement uh, representative from the county parks and recs so that they can actually do more events, because I really haven't seen any events at Larson Park. Um, maybe Maxwell and the one in Glenelg, I think. Um, but definitely that, if even if they pay attention to it and with their community engagement events, that would also, you know, um, you know, be very helpful. And, and it also represents that it does matter to, to the county parks and recs as well. Thank you. Before Karina was involved and Jennifer Gray Thompson was working with me, we did have a Springs Festival in Larson Park and boy, it took a lot of energy to put that on. And then of course, COVID um, hit and so we haven't been meeting. But one of the things that the MAC could do is continue on the tradition of a Springs Festival in Larson Park. And uh, for a while, there was a farmer's market at Larson Park, but it just never had critical mass of support uh, to for people to understand where it was and, and to access the vendors. So there are things that the MAC could be doing with the county, with regional parks, and any ideas you have? Uh, yeah, we know Lupe Navarro is the new community engagement. So I think that it would be important for her to come and do a presentation presentation for us at the MAC um, and see what, you know, their plans are for, for Larson and other Springs Parks. Thank you so much, Supervisor. Great. Karina, did you have a comment? Actually, I think I heard Iris say that she wants to include a couple of letters. Um, so we need to go back to the letter and you need to reapprove it. And I need to know what letters you're talking about and who is providing them. Can unless we you're take, standing as is. Uh, no, we'll include him, but can we take Ray's comment because he's been patiently waiting to for public comment 
and then we can go back and add the enclosures to the letter. Welcome back, Ray. Well, it was pretty sneaky because it's actually Lisa Willett. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm 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 here waiting patiently. Um, I I'm, I'm very. <clears throat> Larson Park is also my neighborhood park. Um, my son and I have spent a lot of time there. We absolutely, 100%, um, I cannot wait for Larson Park to be done and I believe it will be done. Um, and, um, and I will continue to advocate and work and make sure that, 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 that we are squeaky as a wheel so that we get that <laughs> need met because it is a disgrace, the shape that it's in right now. Um, and it shouldn't be that it should be our jewel of our of our community. So I look forward to that happening. And the other thing that I want to talk about today is in Maxwell Park is the skate park. This is really, really important, Susan. And the skate park is getting skipped over because of some sort of a uh, a technicality in the measure M. Is that what's happening? Is they're not going to get funding because it's an existing amenity that's already there. Can you talk about what's happening with the skate park and the funding for that? You know, that's a, a good question for Steve, Eric, and Bert when you invite them to the MAC. I'm not aware of that Measure M would have any restrictions. However, you think Measure M um, uh, actually raises a whole lot of money? Uh, not so much, and especially when it's shared with all the cities. And what Measure M does is approach the long list of deferred maintenance items in 58 regional parks. So when you stretch it across that number of regional parks, it doesn't go very far. I don't think there's a restriction about the skate park, but I know that uh, a group of folks, they made a presentation to you, uh, are working on that and I have some ideas on potential um, fundraising uh, for both the skate park and the BMX uh, pump track, um, but stay tuned. I'm not gonna unveil that yet, but I, I will ask because I'm not aware that that is an issue, but I don't know what their fundraising goal is and I don't know how they're raising money. I was not privy to that presentation. I had to leave a little earlier, so. I'll connect with them, but it's a good question to ask regional parks. Thank you. Fred? Karina, can you move Fred over? Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to uh, compliment everybody here on a really solid, uh, well, well done public meeting. And um, I've been a connoisseur of public meetings, and mm -hmm. and I admire Supervisor Gordon Gordon's uh, ability to lead meetings in the GSA. She's really sharp on the Board of Supervisors. My day is really good. I like all you folks on the Mac here, and and uh, especialmente la producción. Um, that you have this a bilingual meeting is just a really solid solid thing, and I'm really happy to be part of it. Thanks, Fred. <laughs> all right um so let's go back add the enclosures to the uh letter and revote. um karina i just you got them i'm coming sorry i have you guys can't see but i have a zillion screens open so I, give me a second Bear i just e me. i emailed you the um mm -hmm the letters uh give me a second or add the editorial in the letter we'll just take this moment to take some deep breaths please <laughs> um I would suggest and while you're organizing the letter which is important i would suggest that community members in particular like celeste you send uh, every month a few of you send a letter to the board reminding them of the need for parks in renovations, especially at Larson Park. It's pretty easy for the board to just skip over uh, district um, priorities. And yet this 
I've set the stage for a larger discussion. So let's be like, you know, the proverbial little drop that keeps dropping in the water and sending ripples. Thank you. Okay, so we've got two enclosures. We've got two, we've got an article and a letter to the editor. Can I get a, a motion to approve the letter with the two enclosures? I'll make a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Um, that was Hannah and Iris. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. All righty. Okay. We're rounding the corner all. Okay. Here we go. Um, we're at the ad hoc, a very brief update on what's happening with the ad hocs. Also, um, really important piece to this is that if you are communicating with folks about your ad hoc committee, make sure that you're including Karina in those communications so that she can keep Supervisor Gorin updated. Um, I'll do the bicycle rack one first. We haven't made any progress, but we have great intentions and we look forward to making progress in the coming month. That's our report. Um, Community Outreach Ad Hoc, that's Jesus and Hannah. I have nothing Hannah. for this month on this one. Well, Hannah and I, we have been a uh, meeting about something that we're gonna hold in Larson Park. We are planning to do a, Hannah, why don't you talk about it? Because I think it's a different ad hoc, isn't it? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, is that the e-waste event? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so well, part of that is that uh, we're going to be promoting this event um, uh, September 10th, uh, the event that Dana Bravo was talking about. I need to communicate with her about doing this. Uh, and But, yep, yeah, that's it. There's a flyer on our Facebook page, I think, promoting the 910 event. We're getting a lot of support from Nancy Brown's office. Um, community voice ad hoc. We haven't met yet, but we have great intentions and we will be meeting this month. Well, the community voice is actually where this event started, the community. Festival. It did. That's true. Thanks, Muddy so Carmen. It, that's um, where the event is moving forward with a lot of support from the county. Yeah, that's and, true. Uh, yeah, so. Thank you. We're not completely. No, it's in progress. <laughs> it is, we did. So, yeah. so Marty Cutterman's point is we did, we were gonna do a community voice town hall. The county asked us if we wanted to do a fire preparedness event. And so we're kind of morphing the two things together. Um, but we still, I think the intention still is to hold a town hall sometime in the near future. Thank you, Mari Carmen, for um, pulling us out on that one. Um, Rhodes ad hoc is Hannah and Iris. Nothing yet. Karina said she'll let us know when it's time, I think. Okay. All right. And e-waste event ad hoc, Jesus, Celeste, and Hannah. So we did a bunch of planning. Um, today we had a call with someone from Ecology, and it looks like they're going to be able to donate a um, number of bins for our creek cleanup. And I think it's not going to be e-waste. It, it looked really complicated to do e-waste or hazardous pickup. Um, so it's going to be creek cleanup for Coastal Waterways Day, September 17th. And then I'm not sure if we can use the term bulky pickup, but we're getting these huge boxes. So if people in the community, you know, live in apartments or just have like junk that we don't want ending up in the waterways, I think we're going to be able to get enough trash pickup for free that we can advertise that people can bring their non-toxic non-e-waste um household trash to us um including also uh karina had the great point that we should do green waste so you know if people have yard waste and stuff that might be um you know it's flammable materials or you know it's uh, it's fuel so um uh i do have to ask everyone's approval we need for this to be a donation we need to have the ecology center as our sponsor and just make sure that's okay with everyone, I guess. Um, they have worked with me before when I've done cleanups here and when I've done um, compost deliveries here. So they've always sponsored us because we're not a nonprofit. 
So is that okay with everyone? Do we have to take, can we take a vote on that? Now there's Karina, I don't. it says, well, it says resolution on our, on the agenda item. Yes. Um, you would need to just, you know, take a quick vote to okay. approve that you, got, you want to seek um, the ecology centers um, support with, uh, well, being your, your sponsor or okay. your partner, community partner. And I think Joe had, had his um, hand raised. Just a quick question. Do we have a location planned already for this? Oh, it's at Larson Park. I'm sorry if I failed to mention that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so we are doing a couple of events at Larson Park in the next month. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, so can I get a motion to, is it the Ecology Center? Is that who you said it was, Hannah? Yes. Can I get a motion about the Ecology Center being our sponsor for the 917 event? I make a motion that they are a sponsor for the 917 event. Can I that? Hannah and Jesus. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. Okay. We are down to the last agenda item. Um, consideration for future agenda items. Um, I would like to add Steve Arrett and Brett Whitaker to come and talk to us about Larson Park. The other items that we have, Hannah Boy Center, uh, Michael Woods, they have a project on the horizon they wanna share with us. We have mentioned the Springs Farmers Market. Apparently there's a paid position, but can't find anyone to run it. So we've talked about having somebody come talk to us about that. Economic growth and small business, housing, expanding the boundaries of the Springs MAC, business and restaurant permitting, um, the Sonoma Valley Mental Health Collective and Risk, and La Luz and the Education Foundation, their Sueño study. That is what is currently on the list of things to groups to hear from. I'm wondering if there's anyone else we want to add. My team oh, also had uh, superintendent. Hold on, Superintendent Palazuelos. We also had him on as. Um, someone to come and talk to us about the educational status of education. And then Iris, what did you just say? Um, uh, Sonoma, uh, uh, public transit. It would be great to hear, to have someone come from public transit because uh, we, you know, part of the spring specific plan uh, and the concern with SDC is that we reduce vehicle trips and we really need public transit to do that. And it's it's very inefficient in the Valley. Okay, thank you. Are there any other additions? Karina? So, yeah, it, so it came to my attention, um, the Sonoma Ecology Center. Um, so I would like them to come and talk to us if, or if they can, I don't know. Okay. Anything in particular, Jesus? Well, um, we are just finding out that um, they are located at the former SDEC. Um, and I just wanna know about what are their efforts and what are they doing for the community? And since they are our sponsors, so I know that they have a big they, I'm pretty sure they have a big impact in the community. So it would be great that they can present and just talk to us about their goals. Thank you. Karina, was your hand up? Yes. Um, based on today's meeting, I just wanna make sure that I captured um, topics of interest. Um, the SDC draft EIR letter of support, you're gonna have that item at your September agenda. And then everything else I heard today, well ordinance, um, housing strategies with permit Sonoma, tracking of rezoning um, post uh, spring specific plan, ADUs uh, with permit Sonoma, Jane Riley and Tennis Wick, um, 
Social Media Brown Act Training uh, with County Council, uh, Regional Parks, we got that. Um, and I just added um, Dr. Paula Suelos, um, Sonoma County Transit and Sonoma Ecology Center. Yes. Thank you for that. Very good tracking. Um, okay. All right. Um, so um, I'm, we're going to adjourn the meeting here in a second. I have some thank yous, and then we want to close the meeting in honor of a few folks we've lost recently. So um, again, thank you to KSVY for broadcasting and technical support. Thank you to Lynn Marie. Thank you to our interpreter. You are awesome to just hang with us. And uh, Karina and Supervisor Gorin, as always, thank you for your support and thank you to the council members. It's always a pleasure to be in this space with all of you. There's a dedicated group of folks and thank you to our audience for being here and for the last folks who have hung on with us. Um, so we lost several, we lost a few uh, members of our community. Uh, Mr. Tonnery from Flowery recently passed, Margaret Delantoni from Altamira, both teachers in our community for many, many years. So we just want to close in their honor. And also Vern, our first taxi in Sonoma Valley. So we just want to mention their names, say them out loud, enter them into public record, and know that our thoughts are with their families. So um thank you all can i get a motion to end our meeting all motion to end our meeting joe and is there a second a second iris all in favor and juan's vote one two like juan wants uh, to end. yeah <laughs> all right y'all have a beautiful evening and uh we'll see you in a month take care thank, thank you. you everyone Bye. good night Bye. okay bye-bye thank you <laughs>